I said that right when I put a pretzel in my mouth. <laughs> I'll order the uh, town council work session for the 22nd of June, 2021. We just had a tour of a pretty remarkable parking garage. You where we are right now with it. Um, before we begin, we have Dave DePeters from the NRO. He's going to make an introduction for us. So guys, why don't you come on down? Yeah, that way the, you're at the mic, Dave. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, Town Council, thank you for having us. We'll be very brief, but we wanted to let you know, um, first of all, this is this year we are celebrating our 61st season uh, for the National Repertory Orchestra and our 28th year in Brackenridge. Uh, at the Riverwalk Center, our season, given all this that's been going on for the last couple of years, um, is relatively normal. We'll have eight masterworks performances, a pops concert, a free family and kids performance uh, that we're working with the uh, daycares and day camps with, Fourth of July concert with, uh, we're working with the BTO with. We actually have a, a film. Uh, we're going to be doing two Charlie Chaplin films with live orchestra in connection with the film festival. And uh, we have world famous violinist Midori will be uh, performing with us this year. Uh, we will also be having 73 free events um, from open rehearsals to outdoor community engagement programs, mostly here in Breckenridge, but throughout Summit County and Eagle County. Um, we will have a concert honoring our first responders and raising money for those groups not municipally supported. Uh, we will also be giving a concert honoring our first, uh, our frontline workers, since if it weren't for them, we quite honestly wouldn't be having a season this year. So we're very thankful to them. Um, over 61 years, uh, the, I am actually announcing only our third music director in 61 years. Michael Stern is the music director of the Kansas City Symphony, the Stanford, Sin Stanford Symphony in Connecticut, and the Iris Orchestra in Memphis, Tennessee. He literally conducts all over the world and he brings a new direction and energy to the NRO. So I just want to allow Michael to say a couple of words to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Hello, everyone. I know I'm uh, sort of stepping on your bi weekly meeting, but I am really grateful to be able to say hello and just to tell you how honored I am to have the privilege of being here in Breckenridge with the NRO. You know, obviously, after 28 years, as much or more about the NRO than I do, except that I have been here frequently as a guest. It has always been a transformative experience because I understand the incredible mark that the NRO has made on the American musical landscape for the last six decades. Literally, there is no orchestra in the United States that doesn't have graduates from the NRO in principal positions across the board at, in conservatories, universities, in string quartets, teaching positions everywhere. It really is an extraordinary track record. And the fact that I can be with you here and try to add some contribution to that already extraordinary legacy is pretty humbling and very exciting. Um, Dave tells me all the time what a great partner the town of Breckenridge is. And I think, I think the NRO is a great asset for music and for, for Breckenridge, but I think Breckenridge is a huge asset for the NRO, and it's one that we don't take lightly. For me, music is service, and if we can instill in these young musicians the idea that as musicians, holistically, they are going out in the world to do something great with music as a force for good, and because of their experience in Breckenridge, they have a wider view of the world, then we're doing something right. So, I really look forward to um, the years ahead. I am incredibly thankful that for all of your work, we were able to have a season and I commend you for that. And I do think we have an exciting series of, of concerts. The next weeks ahead musically are gonna be great. And I look forward more and more to knowing each of you individually and to becoming at least a little bit a part of this rather extraordinary community. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Michael. Welcome you. to town. Thank you. All right. Um, we're going to move to planning commission decisions. Anybody have any 
questions? There was really nothing going on other than the rules of procedure. But anybody have any questions on the minutes? No, all right. There will be no call up this evening. Legislative, we have uh, Summit Youth Hockey Facility Lease Ordinance. That's me. Yeah, that's me. Uh, this ordinance comes on for second reading uh, tonight. It is an ordinance to approve a long-term lease with SCYH Inc., which is, as I understand it, Summit County Youth Hockey. Um, there are no changes to either the ordinance or to the lease itself from first reading. Thank you, Tim. Any questions? No. All right. We have uh, building height measurement in floodplain area ordinance for first reading. <laughs> Mark. Mayor and Council. Jeffrey, this isn't quite in the, um, now I'm spacing on the name of bookkeeping. Not, that's not the name of housekeeping. Housekeeping. Yeah, housekeeping. It's not quite housekeeping, but it's close. close it's maybe. Kind of garage keeping. <laughs> <laughs> so um, essentially, the issue is, is that the way we measure height, building height, um, when you're in a floodplain, you're automatically kind of required to raise the structure up one foot above the base floodplain elevation. And so in situations where that occurs, like recently Alto Verde, for example, they had to bring in a bunch of fill to get them out of the floodplain. However, the way our um, code reads, you have to, the way staff interprets it, the measurement from the base is actually the natural grade, or in the case, in this case, it would be actually where the existing grade was before we brought that fill in. So if you brought in three feet of fill, really the building is three feet lower than the measurement that we'll give it. And that's just kind of a penalty associated with filling in floodplain areas. So um, what this amendment would do is for areas down in um, a couple of our land use districts, um, 41, uh, 31 and 43, I believe, essentially McKean and block 11 areas. Um, it would provide an exemption so that um, instead of measuring down to natural or existing grade, you would measure down to the proposed grade. In other words, after it had been filled, but only for within areas that are within the floodplain. I attached a couple maps that try to show that um, and the floodplain is pretty confined in block 11, moreover, just towards the river itself. It does spread out a fair amount when it gets onto the McKean property itself, as you can see. Um, this primarily affects town properties, but also the school district properties right in the middle of that floodplain area as well. So it's not just an issue with the town. So that's really a highlight of what this change would do. I'd be glad to answer any questions at this point. Thanks, Mark. Kelly? Mark, um, I know that we're doing this specifically for these <laughs> two land use areas, but are there other areas that this may pertain to where who private developers might come back to us and said, well, you did this for your projects, so why wouldn't you do that for ours? Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Um, and I, I failed to mention that. There are some. Um, primarily, it's um, down towards downtown in the conservation district and historic district. And we were concerned about extending it to that area um, just for the unforeseen. What's that going to look like? Would we all of a sudden have one, one building that's taller than the character of the other buildings around that? Um, I don't know how real an issue that is, but we wanted to be conservative about that. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess that could be an argument that it's not applying across the board, but we had concerns about applying it across the board in other floodplain areas that, um, you know, that's something we could potentially look at expanding on at some point in the future if we thought it was appropriate. Well, I think my concern is less that direction and more that we set this precedent for the town and projects that we want to be, you know, seeing move forward at the full height, but that some developer in the future who we didn't apply this to at this time comes and says, that's really not fair. You set precedent and did this before. Why wouldn't you allow us to do it closer well, to town? 
Yeah, well, I mean, we've talked with Tim about the ability to just apply to these areas. So we have the ability to do that. And if a developer came forward and asked, it wouldn't apply to their project. So they'd have to meet our rules. Now they could make the argument that we're not being fair across the board, Yeah. but then they would have to make a request to amend the code to allow that to happen in their particular land district as well. And we would have grounds to just say, it's not appropriate for the historic district. We could, or if it's in another area that you were okay with, we then could, we, we could also say, <laughs> all right, it's all right. Because really what it does is what does the height appear like mm -hmm. on the site? Yeah. So you know? what is the difference on, on our site or I guess on McCain where we, is it like three feet? The fill that we put, something like that. I'm I'm not sure the exact number, honestly. But I, I believe, huge no, it's not huge. But the other thing I did mention in my um, report or my memo is that we still have policy seven R at play. That if you're benching a site up, you get negative points for that. And so we gave like with uh, Alta Verde, we gave negative points for benching that site. So it's like kind and, of double dipping. Exactly. So that would still be in play and we're not proposing to change that at all. Okay. No. Thank you. I have a question probably for Tim to Kelly's point. I mean that they, you know, if they claim precedent, they wouldn't have any legal basis to sue us on that. I think the location of the property that will be subject to this ordinance is sufficiently different than the other areas that the distinction is reasonable. Great, thank you. Dental that that the properties involved are town and school district. Thanks. I'm okay with it. Oh, great. Other questions? Um, Mark, can you clarify? So if Alta Verde was um, went through the development code with this, would that just be um, if this was in place, it would just be less negative points or how would it have impacted? Yeah, it could. Like if it was three feet of fill and that three feet difference was between getting minus 10 or minus 15 points, that's where that would happen. It just depends on what the exact, um, I, I can't remember. I think it was minus 10 or maybe it was minus 15 that they got. Okay, but that makes sense. Thank you. And is three feet, are you saying three feet because that's the average? Is there a that, chance that we're just it could using go that as higher an ex than three feet? Just using that as an example, Aaron. It could be higher, it could be lower. I mean, typically these floodplain areas aren't five or ten feet lifted up. Okay. But sometimes they have to be lifted several feet. Okay. Thank you. Comment more than a question. I th this is a great map. This is very helpful to me, and it really, for me, really reinforces and maybe this is for a later agenda item but really reinforces the need to, to get the track a or track one into uh, open space um you know it, it, that's gonna be a quite expensive track to build on with that much fill required to build on that so the 19 acres so i look forward to uh us moving on that at some point <laughs> later in this discussion probably mm -hmm. anyone else all right, Mark, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have an ordinance to issue COPs for the dredge drive first reading. I guess this is me unless. You know, you can do much better than me on this. Okay. Um, th this ordinance is the first reading of an ordinance to authorize the uh, COPs for the Block 11 affordable housing project. I did a memo that I hope explained in a way that was comprehensible what it what all this is about. I mean, COPs, certificates of participation are municipal debt, much like a municipal bond, although the, the structure of the arrangement is different. This ordinance um, set some parameters that have been provided to us by our bond council, uh, Butler and Snow, with respect to the principal amount cannot exceed $10 million. Maximum interest rate is not greater than 3% uh, per annum, at least right now. I think the thought is that these parameters will still be good in two weeks when this ordinance comes on for second reading. Those of you that have been around for a while may recall that it, typically with a true bond 
deal, um, we do these as emergency ordinances um, so as to lock in the interest rate. Um, the bond council has advised us it's not necessary here to do an emergency, so this will just be a normal two reading process. Thank you, Tim. Questions? No? All right. Fire restrictions IGA resolution. Hello, Chief. Hello, Mayor Council. This resolution uh, it basically just updates, or excuse me, it approves an updated IGA that we already have with the county and the other towns regarding when we go into fire restrictions. Uh, the difference between this one and the last one was only the elimination of one sentence, just to offer a little bit of clarity. That's really all that it is. Um, but happy to answer any questions if you have. <laughs> questions? Are we going to a uh, higher restriction? Friday uh, at midnight, we'll be going to stage two along with uh, Eagle and Pitkin and a few other places, so. Uh, they're not on our call. They're just in a different, yeah. And one of the issues is when they, uh, they have all those uh, metrics that they use, but one of the things that's not listed in here that they have to factor in is the way resources will start to get scooped up by the existing fires. So that tends to amp us up a little bit. So why Friday? I, it allows for enough time for all of the players to kind of be on the same page because the National Forest is involved. And it, if, if we give it a couple days, it allows uh, people to get their kind of their ducks in a row. Okay. Their mayors to sign the appropriate agreement, things like that. I'm always ready. So we could do it earlier, but you are. it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just th th thank you for pointing that out. That our <laughs> feels like everyone's yeah, Don't forget that. He is a good number too. too. Uh, well, <clears throat> any uh, any other questions? <clears throat> do you have any uh, info on the current fires? On what? On the current fire, in particular, the Sylvan Lake fire. Do you know details on that? It's lightning, is what I heard. That's mm -hmm. that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Shows your faith a little bit in humanity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they'll be closing the range on Friday. Correct. No, yeah. um, no outdoor fires on anything that doesn't have a switch. Yeah. Anything you can't turn off the fuel for. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And no hot air balloons either. Oh, really? Hmm. That's no an what? interesting fact. Dad's in the weekend plans. Yeah. Get a cause on the fair play fire. We'll see Valley this sun. No, but they they were saying that they're expecting that that one was lightning, but they haven't confirmed it yet. But it's out. Sure. Contained. They don't call it out until there's two feet of snow on top. Idea. All right, Jim. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, public projects update. to see everyone again tour that was awesome thanks for coming it's fun uh, i don't have anything to add to the memo but i can take questions on any of the projects gill ice gill ice it's the worst it's been a for a long time it's don't google it no i will not <laughs> don't do it it's exactly what it sounds like oh gill yeah yeah I had him once. PW <laughs> on that whole you get rid plan. Of them yeah. Makes me itch. Any questions for Shane? Are we going to do a, maybe a site visit sometime to the, to the dam? That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. That would be good. James, you happy with uh, progress at the dam? Sorry. Yes, yeah, so everything's on schedule right now, Eric. And um, you know, the next thing that we're kind of going through is just what was previously mentioned, but we are lowering the reservoir right now. And that work is being done in preparation to really to, to start to take apart the crest wall or the spillway. And so we want to dry out that material. So, but everything is on schedule and, and uh, Got to work through the fish, but other than that, the uh, the um, 
the water levels to the neighbors? Um, we're monitoring those wells, Eric. We've um, narrowed it down to about seven um, properties that we think might be impacted. And so we reached out to those individuals. We've given them individual letters and kind of gave instructions for what would, should they notice any difference in their, in their well production or, or their water in their house. And so we have a contractor out of Leadville that's going to be able to provide water or if in event that that should be the case. And then we have a more exhaustive kind of map of the area too. That, so we have a lot of good information. It's just gonna be, we won't know until we really lower it if there's gonna be any impacts, so. How would the Leadville guy provide the water? Would, 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 would he tap into their, their system? So it wouldn't just be like a, a cistern outside the, with a dipper? So they can use their shower and, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, there's a way to recharge their, their well okay. uh, for one of the options. And then depending on um, the type of well they have, we may need to provide them bottled water. So. But if you have to provide them bottled water, would that mean that they could not use their indoor plumbing? Potentially, potentially. Again, we've, we've met with a lot of these people and just asked them to kind of understand their systems. But we feel like the plan that we have right now will adequately address any of the concerns. When will the pond be like totally drained? Um, it'll be 28th, the 28th of this month, it'll be 10 feet down. And then we'll start to go through the fish capture. And then we're gonna start draining it down. So over the next really two weeks, it'll go all the way down to the 98.56, which is really the bottom. Yeah, cool. So, to check it out. Can yeah. we go walk around out there? You can't be out there at all. Ah, uh, no, you don't want to be out there. You, you'll get gill ice. Yeah, you don't want that. It's all really organic matter, and you just you just sink into your your your, your waste. <laughs> hey, James, thanks for communicating with your neighbors and keeping that going. I know it's not easy sometimes. Yeah, it's 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 an ongoing uh, dialogue. <laughs> I can well imagine. Other questions for James or Shannon? First car right. in the garage, November. First car in November. You. Or first Vespa. Yeah, I'm going to bring my prison there. <laughs> no, it doesn't have the clearance, so. Oh, okay. Uh, construction bid policy. You can stay if you want, James. Okay. There's money for somebody. Right? Yeah, that would be good. It's going to be a fundraiser. Okay. For Helga bid policy. Following the discussion we had um, back in May, Tim Barry and I worked on drafting that resolution. If you had a chance to go through it, there's three basic deal points that we have in there. Local is Summit County only. We're going to follow the federal DBE designation administered by CDOT. So the companies would have to register through that system. And then I dropped the tiered system and just went to a flat 3% up to the $20,000 maximum that we had discussed. Those three deal points, and you think the resolution reads, well, we can bring it for adoption. Questions? No, oh, I'm okay with this. Everybody feel good about this? Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Hey, yeah. Bring it. Do you have anything else, Jim? You wanna add this tonight? Um, we can. I'm ready to motion. Oh, and we can look at this again maybe in a year, or council can look at this again in a year. Okay, that would be great. On the projects we bid for next year? Yeah, just, I mean, just to see if it's doing what we want it to do, and if we do need, like we talked about opening it up to Park County and whatever. Okay. What are you doing? Eric, you want to add it to tonight? Yeah. Let's get this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Let's get it on. Thanks. Thanks for the, the big guy. And the next I have on there, the parking structure yeah, update, but we probably answered all your questions on the tour. Yeah. That was impressive. Is better than pictures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, 2021 proposed winter transit schedule. Hi, Jen. Hello, all. This is 
see everyone? I know. Me too. I put a memo in the packet here to answer any questions on the proposed service for this coming up winter. What's your confidence level will be able to hire that many drivers for the winter? Scale of one to 10? Five. Maybe like a four or five. Yeah. <laughs> four or five. Four or five. <laughs> yeah, it's a little concerning. Uh, Rick, will we have enough housing online at that point? Um, we won't have our new housing online, but we are keeping some of the buy downs in anticipation of using them oh, good. for that. Um, obviously, we have the brick terrace units, which have worked real, uh, have worked well for us for transit. So, um, yeah. You know, and, and that's some of the debate, you know, whether obviously there's been you know, we don't in this proposed plan, we don't have purple A and B. There's been a lot of discussion whether that's something we could have. If council still thinks that that's an important route to do, we can try to hire for it, but it would probably be first to go if we can't get staffing. You know, we don't have two uh, trolleys. Um, again, could we run a second trolley during peak periods? Yes, if we can get staffing, right? So there could be some things. I, I think what we'd like to hear from you is, in a perfect world, what would you like to see, knowing that if we can't get there, here's how it'll ratchet down, right? Based on what we're able to uh, hire at the time. So. Is the, the hiring problem primarily housing? No. It, we're hearing this dynamic everywhere right now. There are less people, I think, going back into the market to work the work environment right now for whatever reason and uh, numerous reasons. But that's part of the challenge. And housing certainly, it you know the more it that's that is only a plus for us if we can offer housing because we may capture somebody that that otherwise wouldn't even be here or come here. We have that ability to provide a housing unit. Our, our seasonal workers would go somewhere else seasonally, and those jobs just weren't available just due to shutdowns and cruise lines and those things. And they would come back to us in the winter, and we're just not seeing that anymore. I would, I would sacrifice the trolley for um, not only purple A and B, but also a later finish on eleven fifteen instead of a ten fifteen. You keep one. Trolley. I think that no, I think no trolley. I would sacrifice the trolley entirely because the trolley doesn't actually move people to work. The trolley is strictly for people that don't like to walk up and down Main Street for the most part. I would I would make that the lowest priority and getting locals out of their cars and some of the people that are in these neighborhoods skiing out of their cars rather than the trolley. Okay. The trolley does go out to the ice rink, doesn't it? It does. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if I fully. But there are other routes out of the ice rink. That's not the only way to go. Yeah. That's and just the provides... main street option. But I mean, there are other buses that, you know, the brown goes the ice rink also. Jen, yeah, but... how late? What... So, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. How late was the service? I was trying to it was glean that. 11.15. It was 11.15. Yep. Okay. We just, the reason we chose 10.15 is just the, the ridership starts to fall off. But you know you can capture more folks in the evening, especially if they're coming from from work. Yeah, I have a little differing opinion. I think the trolley is important to for the business community to spread people to the southern part of town and not have the guests so congested in that central area. And with the parking garage opening, yeah, even more particularly so. with the parking garage opening, I think the trolley is important. I, we do need to get people out of our workforce neighborhoods. Um, Airport roads, certainly a high priority is moving those guests. Um, you know, we do have 30 minute service in purple ways and means. I had stuff though, because it goes the wrong way for some people the entire day then. Depending on when you have to get to town, I mean, it, you know, it works for what we've been through, but that's a lot of people that are just going to drive in the winter time. That right now can walk and take their bike. So it's not a big deal currently, but. You know, I, that's the bus, I mean, I hate to say that's the bus I ride. I know how many workers ride that, and they can, there is the same consistent group of people that ride the bus 
at the same time all the time. I think that just some of that goes away if we don't get back to sort of normal service on that route. <clears throat> yeah, I would, I, would agree. I would agree with Eric about, you know, workforce. I, I hear what you're saying about spreading people out, but at the same time, if we have, because we have the parking garage coming online and we have the ice rink on the other side, like maybe it's okay to, that like the parking will naturally spread people out too. Um, but yeah, I think with the workforce, it would be great to get people riding the bus again and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, maybe. Yeah, hopefully we can do both. Hopefully we can do both. Yeah, like may, who knows? Well, I mean, you, we have a pretty good idea. <laughs> like, like the writing's on the wall, but maybe, you what's, know. What's the 615 to 715 ridership like? Um, in the mornings? Yeah. I mean, it depends if the, the yellow route's going to be popular. And then you get a lot of people going to work. The staffing, uh, the staffing impact is not necessarily impacting the later route, is it? That's more of a budget issue. So. It was just more of a budget, and the reason I mean, we, we did can, it, we can just make the assumption that we'll run those. It'll just cost us a little more, but we can run those to eleven fifteen. So I, I wouldn't say that that needs to be a priority. I think what what we need to hear consensus, or at least majority on, is which which half of the third. <laughs> Purple B or the trolley? I'm with Eric and Aaron. I would prioritize the purple route over the trolley. People are already in town if they're taking the trolley. Oh, yeah. Hopefully we won't have to make that difficult yeah. decision, but I'm, I'm with the, the purple. I, I'll, I hate to sacrifice the trolley, but <coughs> prioritize the purple. And what, you know, for every route we do, it takes about three people. Not about it does take three people um, to route. So, you know, where we'll have to have a little bit of uh, latitude is you could, you know, you can get creative if you're one extra person. You might run the trolley during some peak periods, right? On a single ship with one body. You can't do that with necessarily with Purple B. <laughs> but there may be some things we can do knowing that those two are so you know, important is look if we get B and then can we still look at getting the trolley out maybe during some peak periods, weekends, different things where it doesn't take a full, you know, three people to do it, but just with a limited number, we might be able to get, have some creative. We can certainly try. I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll try to staff up to this level at the 35 and we can make those tweaks and add the, the B back in and no trolley. And then if we do, if we get lucky with recruitments and it's not a scale of five, maybe it's more of like an eight and we're getting more, then we can consider adding some service back in. But I do just want to preface, we might need to plan for a service less than this. Yeah, Under, understand. I mean, in the end, I think going to 1115 is the, the most important piece. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of late night workers that need that. Get the drinkers off the road. You know, that and just workers, I mean, I mean, the drinkers need to be off the road anyway, but they, and they're, honestly, they're people that, that won't use it to come to town when you're busy and you have to stay at work later, then they'll just drive. And that's really what we want to yeah. avoid. So. And it would be curious to, I'd be, I'd be curious to see what happens next, you know, and after, after the pandemic, maybe new people are coming to town. Maybe I, yeah. I don't know. I, I'd be curious to see how the bus use changes. Well, I mean, no capacity. There'll be probably no mass at that time because that ordinance ends in September thirteenth. Uh, yeah. So people can hopefully feel pretty confident riding transit, which but they kind of already are right now. So, yeah. right. do is um, give you guys an update, kind of mid recruitment period, which will start really as, as soon as possible. And let you know where we are. Jen, thanks. Thank you. No, I don't. Phone keeps buzzing. Uh, housing and child care. Hello, Lori. Um, How are you? Um, <coughs> do you have anything to add to the minutes that were in your packet? So I'm just here if you had any questions or comments on the minutes from that meeting. I just say thanks for looping in the county on the whole landing locals discussion. I think we've all mentioned this that this is a broader solution. So I'm glad they're looped into the conversation. Yeah, I actually um, 
uh, emailed back and forth um, with landing locals this morning, and we expect to get the proposal tomorrow or the next day. Great. Yeah. Hey, Lori, is that um, is that three thousand dollar grant a one time grant, or is it three thousand dollars? Per year. No, what Truckee does is they do a 3000 It's a one time, but they get it in two pieces. They get it um, when the tenant first moves in and then get it at the end of the one-year lease. And they hope uh, that the, the landlord will find that it's working for them to have that long-term tenant in there and will continue the lease. <laughs> Move the mic a little closer to you. Oh, yeah. You got a comment that you're hard to hear. I'm sorry if I shouldn't know this already, but what is RFOR? Uh, first right of refusal, um, basically, is that, okay. that has to do with like Valdezair and Gold Camp where okay. we have, yeah. we own a unit in there. And so when any of those units sell, we have the right to match that offer and acquire the unit. And we had a little discussion on when we should do that. And um, obviously we don't want to kick out a local buyer um, with our first right. Um, um, but the realtors aren't always able to tell us who the buyer is, so we don't always know. But. And, and we never know the intention of the local buyer. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, for term renting. It's correct. Right. They could yeah. be local or not. Correct. Yeah. Exactly. The impact is the same. So. Other questions? From one a couple months ago that now has a short term <coughs> rental license. <coughs> Seriously? Really? Yeah, we had actually exercised our first right and we withdrew it. We withdrew it because they called and out the people. Weren't they they're gonna use it for their staff in the winter? <laughs> we'll see. Um, you know, I think they intend to use it for their staff at some time, mm -hmm. maybe. Oh. 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 All right. Great. Thoughts, anyone else? Because we, I mean, we were considering kind of slowing down that policy. I mean, we all are in the public and hear these things. So I guess I'd love to hear if anybody else has thoughts on that. Slowing down what policy? The backing off for local buyers, because we just don't know what their intentions are. Yeah, the most recent one that we talked about, maybe we should <laughs> exercise it. It went under contract. Um, so I called the realtor to, to see it's this local buyer and what are their intentions. Um, and the realtors don't, don't always really know. Um, they can say, yes, it's a local buyer. They happen to have $650,000 cash um, and they intend to occupy it, but we never know. Yeah, you have 600,000 cash. You're gonna live in- Yeah. yeah. Well, as a business buying it for- Employees. Yeah. employees. This is a different one. This is um, the one that we withdrew was could the business be. to use it for employees. So but this one, business, we don't know, right? Well, yeah. according to the realtor, the um, buyer will occupy the unit. Okay. Yeah. So this right it's now we have the informal policy where if it's a local buyer, we just back off is what we're doing now. We've done it once, right? Yeah, we've twice. done it twice yeah. now, really. Yeah. Because yeah. we don't want to compete against local buyers. That, we want those. Right. That's right. who we'd like to have in there. But but the one thing, the one thing we could change and consider, but we did talk about this with one of these local buyers, is that we offered to buy it and sell it to them with the deed restriction, which still would have accomplished employee housing, but it would have taken away their capability to resell with the option to short term. We were going to buy it and sell it so, to them at a reduced price. Mm -hmm. It would have been, yeah, the same as like our buy down program. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we lose the opportunity to get a deed restricted because, you know, assuming appreciation continues, it's going to get more and more expensive yeah, for right. us to buy if and when it's ever resold. So we could modify our policy that we don't back off, but that we do ask or tell them we'll sell it to them, but it's going to have this deed restriction on it. I mean, it's definitely a hard call because, you know. You know, the other thing we can do is we can forge ahead on these. And I mean, just like before, we'll hear about it probably. And we can kind of look at it on a case by case basis. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got to remember, you know, I mean, this, this, this is getting worse. I mean, I know you guys look at the licenses each week. It's, yeah. we're losing them every week. We're losing long-term or historical or good fit to long-term rental properties. And, you know, Steamboat just passed a moratorium. 
Trustee Butte has passed a moratorium or a, or a cap, you know. I mean, we're, we're far from the most aggressive community here. Yeah, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. And we're starting to fall behind in this policy. Absolutely. We're missing some opportunities. Okay. I, I'm inclined to, you know, I, and I'm on the housing committee, that's why I'm trying to engage and get together mm -hmm. talking because we all can't agree to the decisions. I mean, my inclination is to, unless somebody really assures us that they intend to put an employee in there, in which case we can really pitch the deed restriction. Well, I just don't think they I can assure us unless they do take the yeah. deed restriction, like, what well, you know? Exactly. And I mean, good intentions could also end in, right. you know, somebody needing to sell it for good, you know, like not, yeah. not maliciously, but we, right. you just can't tell what's going to happen. Yeah. I don't know. I think you look at those as a, every case is a little bit different. I mean, I think it's hard just to have a blanket policy for those. Yeah. yeah these are, well, we do policies. now kind of to back off. And so maybe we try to strike the middle somewhere. I'd like so. to be a little more firm. <clears throat> um, yeah. And the honor system works great for me, food stands and stuff. But I don't, you know, as far as deed restrictions, man. Uh, I just think the point is that nobody wants to do this. It's not like any of us want to have to make this choice of yeah. outbidding a, lo a local, but we're, I think we're to a point where we have to make some really tough decisions to ensure that our community remains intact. And this is probably one of the easier <laughs> of the tough decisions that we need yeah. to start thinking about. And we have that first right in Valdezere and Goldham. So, I mean, those are important yeah. um, I mean, local are complexes important that we would yeah. like to And it's retain. Point. They're perfect. They're yeah. perfect locations for long-term. So whenever a unit comes online, we have first right of refusal. Whenever an operator. Owners. Every right. owner does Complexes. in the building. Yeah. What? what? Too many of us talking. Every owner in the building has the first right of refusal. Oh, for the, okay. For those two properties. And since and we're, we're one owners. of the owners. I mean, in those yeah. two where those specific units, I would say we exercise our first right of refusal. I mean, those are so perfect for workforce houses. And then otherwise on a case-by-case -case basis, um, this helps a little bit. Again, this are just kind of drops in the bucket, though. From yeah. It is amazing how many resales are going on right now in Gold Camp. It is on fire. And so, you know, those units are selling right now to a person that's going to own them likely for five or ten, or we don't know when our next chance will be. Um, I mean, they are just, every day I'm getting... Um, you know, the letters on the first right. And, and, I, and I suspect the same will happen with Valdezera when the oh yeah. finished. Yeah. When they get that work done. Yeah, I think I think we buy them and sell them with the deed restriction. That's Good deal. Thank Anything you. else? Just one thing, uh, it's just clarification. It, buy them and sell them with the deed restriction. Does that mean that someone has to pay two real estate um, uh, uh, commissions? Um, I guess the seller pays um, when we buy it, the seller pays, and then we pay when we sell it. Now ours is discounted. We don't yeah. pay a full. I just wonder if we could look at, look at rather than doing it two separate um, process to do it with a, uh, just a buy down. You well, we I mean? would love to, um, but um, you know, some mm -hmm. people choose for some reason not to not to want to use um, the buy down or the housing help process for okay. some reason, want to sell it on the market. They think they can get a better price, whatever. And so we only find out about it once it's gone okay. under contract. I get you. I get you. All right. And we're experiencing realtors that are all over the place. We've got some realtors in town that are awesome. I mean, yeah. they're bringing us properties. They're seeing properties that are. The right I'm going to go see one on Friday. Yeah. yeah that the realtors bring it back. Calling. I've gotten several calls. Lori's gotten calls. You know, awesome. hey, this would be good. Then we have realtors when we ask them, they're like, I'm not talking to you. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't like you guys. We're not talking to you. So we've got kind of both extremes. I can imagine people not on. liking us. <laughs> I can you. introduce you to some. <laughs> <laughs> So I, you know, there's there's really some good good ones out there. Yeah. That are really allies trying to help. It's great. Good. Well, that's great. We will not be hesitant to exercise our first right because we've been like, no, do we, should we? We're not. 
Yeah. Um, and especially when it's been a cash offer and um, it was, you know, previously not a short term. And we're then that's when we're really concerned it's converting to a short term. Yeah. yeah. Great. All right, Lori, thank you. Uh, committee reports, there was summit stage. Any questions? Oh, yeah. one quick question. What's SRTP? Thank you. Oh. Short range transit plan. Oh, thank <laughs> Thanks, you. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, sir. Yeah, you know. Uh, finance, financials. Leslie. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Oh, okay. We did a thing. We did a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are May financials that are largely the April tax numbers that were received in May. There's not a lot um, to report over what we discussed last month. However, we did add the column to compare 2019 to 2021, that? Yeah. which is, yes, a lot more helpful. Like if you look on page 101, it talks about for 312 percent above 2020, that doesn't mean very much. Um, however, it is very interesting that we're 45 percent over 2019. Um, but do keep in mind that this is a low volume month. Um, it really just means that April was like August of 2019, so still kind of a smaller month. Which is um, pretty significant. I mean, we've had a lot of discussions about the leveling out the business in town. Mm -hmm. that, that's significant in those efforts. Yeah. Um, and, you know, lodging really outperformed. They were a, a lot of that as well. So keep in mind, though, that lodging is largely based upon bookings and not stays. So you're really seeing that pent up travel demand um, is reflected in a lot of that as well. Um, and we do have some June um, to date uh, rent numbers for you. It's at 539,000, which has exceeded the budget of 368,000. Jeez. So. Red is still gangbusters, which I guess follows the last conversation. <laughs> Any questions? Retail continues to do very well. Yes, which is great. Yes. Um, yeah. A couple of restaurants, they finally picking up. Yeah. Because that's been a bailiwick. Yeah, I mean, you can see on those pie charts where it talks about the percentage. It shows the percentage of the. Sectors, yeah. restaurants has definitely decreased over time as the, it's part of the pie. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Thank you. All right, Water Peak Trailhead and shuttle discussion. Hello, Mayor and Council. Um, as many of you know, the Town of Breckenridge has been involved in a large stakeholder group examining um, congestion really at the Quandary Peak, McCullough Gulch and Blue Lakes Reservoir area for the last couple of years. And we've been trying to come up with some adaptive management strategies to deal with this congestion. And last fall, all of our area land managers that own land in that area decided to get together and hire OTAC to really examine this transportation and visitor use management and hopefully develop a framework of adaptive management strategies for us. Um, so there were some Blue River, Summit County, um, we've had some great stakeholders um, working with OTAC over the last um, nine months or so. Um, their draft report was included in the packet today. The survey that they did last fall um, is also included in there, which is pretty um, enlightening. And really the result of working with OTAC, we've learned that the number one issue is really parking. Um, it's not resource damage, it's parking, and then the related emergency access to that area as well. And our stakeholder group has not um, fully gone over these results. It's still at a draft report, um, but OTAC uh, went to the BOCC recently to present these preliminary findings. And the BOCC is very action oriented right now and decided to tackle some of the low hanging fruit um, hopefully immediately um, since the high summer season of hiking um, is just upon us now. So they've actually directed their staff to tackle two issues, um, one of which is the expansion of the Tra Quandary Creek Trailhead, and the other is to implement a pilot shuttle program. 
So regarding the trailhead, um, the town of Breckenridge is actually a 50% undivided interest owner in that parking lot. Um, we purchased it jointly some, I think about 10 years ago with the intent of providing some parking for that area and knowing that we could add potentially an additional 20 spots um, to the parking area. So parking area right now only holds 65 cars. And if you've been up there on any given weekend, you'll see it's a bit of a free for all, um, undesignated parking. And with the frequency with which um, Summit Search and Rescue is up there, it becomes really, really difficult for emergency vehicles to get in and out of there with just that haphazard parking um, that exists. So the, the county has proposed having their road and bridge internally expand this parking area, um, which would eke out another 20 spots, which is really a drop in the bucket, but it really does address, I think, the emergency access that's needed in there. If they can delineate parking spots and make sure there's room for emergency access to have ingress and egress out of there, um, that's much needed. And so we are um, kind of catching up to the county and want to bring this to you um, as, as joint owners of that, um, whether or not you're supportive of the idea of this expansion. Um, the OTAC report, if you did glance at it, um, points out that on our kind of busy weekend days during the, the high season of hiking, um, there are about 360 to 400 cars that park up in that area. So going from 65 spots to 85 really <laughs> doesn't solve the entire solution, um, but we are working jointly with our partners to address things like parking, additional enforcement, um, signing um, throughout that area, trying to really tackle this um, in a multi-pronged approach. But this is pretty low-hanging fruit um, that would at least address some of those emergency access issues that, that we have up there. Um, and BOSAC did review this. They voted unanimously to expand um, the parking area. The other issue um, that the county have directed their staff to examine is a, a pilot shuttle program. Um, and the county is really examining all issues at this point, whether or not that's contracting with a private entity, how they might run that. One of the challenges that they've, they've discovered is where do people park to board a shuttle? Um, and so they are looking to the town of Breckenridge to see if we have available parking lots that might accommodate such a use. Um, which would at least um, provide some parking <laughs> solution up there at Quandry. And so really those are the two questions that we have for you today is whether or not you are supportive of expanding this trailhead. Um, the county feels they can do it in-house and do it soon. So that really as the season gets going this year, we can still um, have some better parking <clears throat> solutions and really make sure that emergency services can get in there. And also really kind of delineate, there's a helicopter landing area kind of between the parking trailhead and Highway 9, um, which gets um, parked with cars all the time. It was this weekend um, and really making sure that is free so that search and rescue has, has a way in and out of there. Um, and second issue is just if you're supportive of the idea of a shuttle and having staff sort of work with the county to see if there are parking solutions we can, we can work on them with. Questions? How much is it gonna cost us? It's, it's going to be a county effort. They're going to do it in-house. So at this point in time, there's no cost to us. On the shuttle, um, of course, I think we all know about Hanging Lake, which I think that's a very unique situation where mm -hmm. they have nowhere, no county roads to expand to. Um, but other than that shuttle example, do you know of successful shuttles in the state? Oh, I think the Marine, Maroon Bells system is another successful shuttle um, program that we've also looked at. Um, you know, the, the, I think the Sheriff's Office and Road and Bridge have a lot of concerns with allowing parking, which currently is not allowed on, on county roads, on McCullough Gulch Road and also Blue Lakes Road, which you're also impeding in people's uh, neighborhood there as well. Um, and so they're, they're thinking the shuttle, again, is an adaptive management solution. Um, you know, with these approaches, we try incremental changes, we see what works, if it doesn't, we pivot, we make other changes, um, but it seems like a, a good first step. I think the shuttle only works if there's no parking or there's or there's permit parking yeah because if you have open parking and you have a shuttle why would you take the shuttle i mean that, that just doesn't even make any sense to me to even start a pilot program i think it will not be successful unless there's a limited amount of parking up there that you have to get a permit for and i i think the thing that's getting glossed over here i think they need to up the enforcement I, I understand what their problem is. I understand 
that they'd like to know who owns the cars they're ticketing. But at some point, that's the biggest problem is parking on illegal parking on the highway, illegal parking on county roads. Because if you park on any other highway or any other county road, you're getting a ticket. And the, the fact that they've allowed this for so long, I think is really, I agree with expanding the parking. I think that's pretty much no brainer. But after that, the number two low hanging fruit should be enforcement you know, before anything else really gets done. And then if you're gonna do a shuttle, you know, you have 85 spaces or whatever that's permitted. And then after that, you take the shuttle. But other than that, that's just, I mean, all you're going to do is have people drive up there and then yeah. drive back to get on the shuttle. And that, or that defeats a, purpose. Or it's a different route. I mean, really, like you, you can see from the surveys that they did, um, people aren't upset about the parking. You know, like they go and they figure it out and it's, it's fine. So if we add a shuttle in the state, um, and it's not we, if the county, which that's something that I think Scott and Ann had to clarify with me, I had to wrap my head around. <laughs> if the county adds a shuttle, are they just adding a shuttle, right? Like literally, like just those people are new people that, that wouldn't be hiking quandary that day, or there are people who, would nor who aren't drivers, they're shuttle people. And so we're adding, you have the drivers using the parking and now you have the shuttle people taking the shuttle. It's, it's additive versus taking away from, but that's also, it's the county's shuttle. I, you know, the, this frustrates me no end. I, I agree with what Eric said. Um, one, 20, 20 cars is like 5% increase if there's a 400 car a day. Um, it should, we should look at permitting, a, a, a permit to climb quad, to permit it, you know, I, I think probably the, the brand, the easiest way, the low hanging fruit is permitted parking, like Eric mentioned before. And then then enforcement on the highway. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it seems like we know what the problems are. We know what the solutions could be. Instead, we say, oh, let's add 20 cars. I mean, well, it's, it's just- Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. It's, it's the- for me, it's it's not. I do not think this is solving the problem. I think it's for the emergency vehicle. I'm, I'm down with that. That's why I'm supportive of this. I have no false intention of this is solving the problem at all, except for the emergency vehicles, which is Im important to me. But I think it gives an out to the people that could make the decision to permit it, to enforce it by saying, "Oh, well, they're going to add 20 cars, so maybe we don't. Maybe we, we can sit on yeah. our hands for another year." I mean, that, and, and also I question the fact that there is no resource damage. I mean, in the springtime, it looks like a Dalmatian's back. There's so much toilet paper around there, even, even with the, uh, even with the porta potties. I mean, this is, this is an attractive nuisance. We have taken this, 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 you know, gem and we've allowed it to just get totally impacted. I mean, by, by, by too many people on a give on a, on a finite area and it could be resolved with those two things, uh, with permitting and enforcement, but no one seems to be willing to do that. Well, I think what's tough with this one is that we, uh, we're we in $5,000 of a half of a parking lot. Like it's not our land around there. It's not our land on the trails. It's not, so it's really, this one's, a, I struggle with this one a lot because, you know, usually we're presented a problem, we solve the problem, right? And here we're in it for, for half of a, parking garage and it's, it's just a tough one well we're collaborating with or a lot of agencies lot. like we yeah. did in in our clear cutting and our for, um, yeah. forest management plan which has been hugely successful it can be done i i agree with a lot of what's been said especially jeffrey i um i do think we should do support the parking lot work but not as much from the adding 20 spots but organizing it yeah. and creating a situation for the emergency use as well as enforcement. We need to have some teeth in this. We need to have some serious enforcement with serious fines. This, this does affect our community members, our workforce, the people that live up there, their quality of life has gone to hell. And, and they are really frustrated. And I've got friends that, 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 yeah. that are in our Breckenridge workforce and, and they are really frustrated. They've got kids. And, and they're trying to raise families up there and it's just crazy. And so I, I, I think we support the parking lot work, but really for not the reason of adding, but the reason of organizing. 
in allowing for enforcement. We really encourage and push enforcement. And I think we really encourage and push uh, um, permitting. And I wonder, is it time to do a joint meeting with the county commissioners now that we have new commissioners? And this could be one item on yeah. the agenda. Who could permit it? Is that, the, is that, would that be the county or is that the Forest Service? I don't know who would do it, you know? Parking or for uh, res parking. for parking would be county right there. So the county could tomorrow start uh, researching a program to, to uh, permit for that. parking. I, I think the distinction is reserving just to get on to the trail and, and the county has a lot of concerns for equity sake. Um, if, if there's an online reservation system and people who aren't computer savvy or have good Wi-Fi can't reserve a spot, which I get, but permitting for parking is an entirely different story. I think there's so many permitting... different ways to do it. I think we could do it in an equitable way. I mean, we talked we talked about options like yeah, that too. I, but yeah, I do think that we can make it equitable. I don't, I think saying that it's online or that's the only way to do it. I think that there's many different ways to do the, it. The problem with permitting the trails is we don't have the resources to do it. There's so no. many ways no, to access those yeah. trails. Yeah. Permitting the parking, we have to do if we're gonna think about a shuttle. You know, Eric, remember we saw a, per, a presentation in a cast meeting, I believe it was, about the Hanging Lakes. Oh, yeah. I think you were yeah. there. And it was a joint venture with the the, um, the uh, Chamber of Commerce in, in Glenwood. It was joint venture with a private operator, which I believe is Peak One here, it was Duke, and, and the Chamber and the Forest Service. And they did a joint venture and it's been hugely successful. There's no parking. And there's no parking. There's, they can there block their, So that's why we have to have the show. permitting. We yeah. have to have the organization. We probably need to move a bunch of rocks around up there and just prevent parking in many of those areas. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't like camp in a state park without online reservation. Exactly. People, so, I mean, this equity... trail users are used to permit. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Well, we could do it out of the visitor center. You know, like there's, that's there's what ways I was to do it where, you know, that's that would be a more equitable, you know, maybe we do half, whatever. Well, what's I, I the equitable thing? Is that because people don't don't have, know how to use it, don't have a smartphone? No, we don't have. Oh, yeah. Wi-Fi access, you know, well, like. For me, it's equitable because there's a shuttle. And that's that's open to all. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. I mean, the permits yeah. are just those that want to drive, and you know. And you know, maybe I mean, since the it, the county is asking for space for the shuttle, perhaps that's you know part of our negotiation there yeah. is to say, if you know, you if you permit it, we'll allow for parking and for some space for the shuttle or something like that. But yeah. also, oh. that seems to make sense. Another like thing that I'd like to hear before we give up any parking is what um, Summit Search and Rescue says about all these people. Yep. Like if they can really only handle 85 people going up there per day, then it's just the people in the parking lot. Why add a whole entire shuttle? I mean, that seems like a... Yeah, I, I do know at least Lloyd Ahern with Colorado 14ers, um, Nikki LaRochelle reached out to him the other day just to ask about trail concerns, um, environmental degradation up there. And he said, they've done so much work um, hardening the trail surface over time that there's not ecological damage. Um, they're, no, I, but I mean like humans oh, from who are humans. injured and that they have to go up and yeah. treat them. I don't have the stats on how many search and rescues other than it's a pretty frequent occurrence during the summertime months. And so I think so, you want to talk to that group. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big absolutely. impact. And beyond, the, beyond, the, the, beyond the environmental impact on the trail, there's an uncomfortable thing that happens on Quandary with the amount of people that are up there and the amount of people that are not really ready to be up there. I mean, there's plenty of days that if you, if you are local and you know what to do, you get up at four, you're at the parking lot by five, you do the hike. And then on the way down, there's a stream of people that is somewhat uncomfortable to pass by. So there's more than just, yeah, look, the trail can handle it. There's an enjoyment factor there too that I think that the permitting also goes yeah. a long way to help with that. And with the permitting and the shuttle is that you, you're not, either way, you're not just going. And so for the safety factor, um, well, first of all, it'll funnel it so there's fewer people, but also for the safety factor, you can get in front of them. Like say you did have to go to the, um, to the visitor center, then you know, our, our people could put information in front. Like, do you have all of these things before you go? Same thing with the shuttle. There's that information block where you, you, you have, you can communicate with people, which I think is attractive too. I think the permanent definitely adds an opportunity for education. I'm still hesitant on the shuttle where there are so many options to just 
park illegally there. And I mean, I tentatively support it this year as a pilot, see how it goes. But what's been said, like enforcement, like we need to do a lot of enforcement. Um, and then to Jeffrey's analogy of camping, like people know there's natural capacity limits. If you're not there early enough, you're not gonna be able to make it. Definitely part of the framework of all these management strategies is a lot of enforcement and a lot of signage. Um, so, so those are also happening with all of our stakeholder groups too, which hopefully will, will help. Yeah, maybe in addition to the signage, I think, you know, deterrence like the boulders and things, yeah. I just don't think we can rely on signage alone. People don't read signs, no, by the way. All right, does that give you enough info? It does. For how we feel, it. it's not gonna make a much difference, but that's how we feel. Uh, uh, into the passion. Passion was right? great. Oh, we've been dealing with this for a long time. You know what I mean? This is like, it's, it's not like it's a surprise. Uh, Planning Commission appointments, Mark? Thanks, Eric. Uh, we, uh, a couple of our staff members, along with one of our planning commissioners, interviewed some planning commission candidates. We had four of them in your packet. You see they're listed out. <coughs> and we have recommended that two of them be appointed uh, Mark Leas and. <coughs> Whoa. Excuse me. me. Oh, <laughs> And Fretcher. Um, be glad to answer any questions. Both of them bring some good experience to the table. In particular, Mark has a lot of experience um, back in Georgetown, D.C. area with historic restoration projects. So very glad cool. he'd be a good fit for the commission. Yeah, both these guys are cool, but the whole everyone that applied is amazing. The credentials there. Yeah. That's that's really yeah, that's heartening. A qualified group. Yeah. 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 Uh, any questions or comments about it? everybody good with these two for tonight? All right. Mark, thank you. And I'll just jump right into McCain. Yeah, please. Um, Shannon, can you bring up that map for the... Track eight is what I was speaking of. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I always call it the 19-acre track. Just start rounding up, maybe they'll just look around. <laughs> 25 <laughs> acre track. <laughs> Which one is this? All right, thank you, Shannon. Um, Does it coincide with the the master plan is essentially the zoning for the property. And um, since we've had these discussions about um, the housing project, the nonprofit campus, we need to put those pieces in place in the master plan as essentially entitlements. Then when these projects come through, they're consistent with the master plan, which they need to be in order to you know, pass planning analysis. So what we've done is, and I've outlined in my memo, the different tracks that are affected here. Track 14 in yellow there, there's eight and a half acres. That's where the additional up to 200 units of housing would be located. And you guys saw a conceptual of that, I think a couple of weeks ago. Um, then we have track six, which is about five acres for nonprofit slash institutional. Um, uses. I added the institutional in there just because it provides for, for example, government type uses if we ever had something we wanted to do in there as well. That includes the pond area, which it may be that we can put enough structural fill in on the southern part of, the, part of that and the little fingers to allow some buildings, but for the most part, that's not going to be able to support buildings. So not all that comes into play. Um, and I think we saw that in the conceptual before, but maybe parking could go on some of that pond area, for example. Otherwise, um, we're showing that it will also be open space and kind of a landscaped entryway to the whole area. Um, 
two-part question on that, and maybe Shannon could help with it, Shannon Smith. Did, did I remember in a discussion, I believe in our housing committee, where we talked about is, will that, will we know more about the structural ability of that fill after six or seven years after it settles? Do I remember that correctly? Okay, so after six or seven years, there's a chance we could potentially build on it or, or do something more affordably to be able to build on it, maybe. Maybe more like one or two years. Could you put solar plant panels on it? I was going to ask if we're still going to be building solar panels or I mean having farms here I mean yeah. I think it makes sense for us with how valuable property is to be yeah. buying into solar farms not locally but that I think I just want to make sure that we talk to Jesse about that and we have done that and we, we we're buying into several right now, including Pivot Energy. I think essentially like four of these solar gar gardens that we have, right. we're participating in. So we're definitely involved with that. And there's, you're right, there's next to no place left to, to do them. Well, so. and I, I mean, I just always thought once these panels are done, we'll probably use that location for something different because solar and wind through Excel will or through, you know, being able to purchase off, out, yeah, off site, I think will make way more sense. So I'm really um, tentative to add to the solar farm there because I don't know how far we are into that farm 10 years or something, but if those panels are done in 15 years, I would rather use that property for something not solar. Yeah, we talked with Eric Westerhoff. He said, actually, they're, they've only, depreciated a little bit in terms of their performance so far in the 10 years. So, um, and I, I forget, I think the lease was 25 years to start with on those. So there's still a lot of productivity left in those, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, we did add the, the solar on this tract 4A. It used to be just shown as kind of like an open space buffer. Mm -hmm. And, but the reason we did that was because we're trying to offset um, go net zero on the housing. And we're worried that we don't have quite enough land to get the solar in. Now, I don't know how easy it's going to be to actually just add solar in that area, but we wanted to at least make an attempt at examining that and seeing if that'd be a possibility so we could reach our net zero goals there. And is that what Jesse suggested doing in that location? That's what Rick and I suggested. <laughs> <laughs> that is just i'd really like jesse to weigh in on this sure. because yeah. she's the expert to say whether it's worth it for us to be adding to a solar here on site or if we should just be all off site in some cases we we increase our costs trying to add on site totally and it might be cheaper to buy it somewhere else and still accomplish the same thing right exactly yeah, that makes sense to look at that a little more. Now, what we lost, what used to occupy track 14 and 6 was public works storage, about four acres, and then about 10 acres of snow storage. So to compensate for that, we've done a couple of things. One is on track two, um, the seven and a half acres near the highway there. That used to be all just designated for service commercial. You remember, it's always been kind of a, we want to keep some availability for service commercial um, in the community because it's kind of going away to a certain extent. It's hard for contractors, yards, things like that to find places. Anyway, we, we still identified that, but we also identified that for public work storage. It's possible too that could be used for snow storage as well. I mean, I think we've got obviously some flexibility there. So um, we have included that on track two. And then the other thing we did on track eight was in addition to open space, we added the slash snow storage. Now I know there's issues related to that, that we need to probably have a discussion about whether we want to do that or not. I mean, the end of the day, it's, it's pretty ugly in the spring when it all melts out and there's a lot of trash and things there. Um, but we're also running out of land as we start to you know, program the rest of McCain. So um, those are the changes. And what we would do now is 
after we get direction from the council is um, take this through a process with the planning commission and all town project ultimately come for a town project hearing with the council as well to amend the master plan. Is your concern about snow storage that close to the river? Well, there's a lot of concerns about snow storage. I mean, so my concern about using open space, I, I think it's said in here that the policy for open space actually allows for snow storage. And I think we should really be reevaluating that because if open space is just meant to not be built on, and it doesn't matter if it's a gravel area or whatever, but at least there's not a building, then that's one thing. But if we're talking about open space for habitat and for water purification and for kind of, you know, environmental reasons, I don't think it should be sharing. And there's a lot of reasons like gravel for one, you're going to bring a ton of gravel in and then cover the entire area. And then you're going to need in the spring to bring a bunch of trucks or, you know, graders and things in and pull all that gravel out. And so not only are you disturbing the land over and over, but like that totally loses its habitat value if you're trucking stuff in and dumping it and then you're grading it out. So, I mean, I don't know exactly how many acres we're looking for for snow storage. If it's, you know, just a couple of acres at the corner there, then maybe that's something we can consider. But I think we know, need to know specifically how much we're talking about on that 19.9 acres because it, you know, I just think that's something we need to evaluate before we decide to share that open space as no storage. We've had conversations with James because obviously he, you're right. I mean, he shares all of your concerns and they're, you're 100% accurate. It, it's not a good experience <laughs> for that area. And you're going to, you know, you're going to hurt the area when you do that. And, you know, what, what we'd like to do is we'd like to basically take over that track too. You know, we'd like to give pretty much what's a single tenant left out there. Uh, notice that in three to five years, you know, that at some time in three to five years, we would, they would be out of there. And it's, you know, it's one landscaping company that's left. You know, and uh, and uh, that, as long as we still have the Stilson property and we have that seven and a half acres uh, there, we feel we could meet a big part of our need, right? Close. The poor people can't hear you. Um, I was just going to kind of expand on the snow storage and what the need is. And Rick is is very close to to being accurate on a big. <laughs> really. Oh, well, general. That's new. Should we give him a card? <laughs> Let me restate that. <laughs> I thought it was perfect. <laughs> Historically, we, we, on average, are about 10 acres for snow storage. One thing to keep in mind as we continue to build out in, in town, um, for instance, curb and gutter, sidewalk, all that, all those areas require removal. So it just kind of continues to add to that drive that need for more snow storage. So we that's the biggest thing that we've seen over the years is just where we've historically been able to push back or just uh, when we're off the road, we now are removing. So 10 acres is really what we're talking about for snow storage, in addition to anywhere from five to seven acres for just storage of materials. We manage a lot of, whether it's a recycled asphalt that gets milled off the roadways, concrete, uh, we, for our own projects, we import a lot of dirt, manage a lot of um, materials. So Stilson and McCain are kind of being used in court or collaboration for that. But as that all becomes, you know, that becomes developed, we're, we are kind of facing that challenge of how we best and most efficiently do this. Do those James, what does curb and gutter have to do with it? Why, why does that um, uh, require removal opposed to push, pushing back? Probably the, the best example is on Main Street. You know, there's a lot of snow, you know, throughout the course of the day that in turn turns to pack. We go in there, we remove it. First part of that process, we wind road up against the curb line, but then it starts to narrow the roadways. 
So we're not able to, to, to spill it onto the sidewalks or in the planter beds for, for the known reasons. Yeah. And so we have to go in and windrow it, and drive it out of town. And so anywhere there's sidewalk, curb and gutter becomes a removal area. But James, we have storage now for all the things that we're building out there. At the, for right now, as we're looking at it, yes. But you're not gonna haul it all the way to Stilson. You haul a lot, quite a bit, Dennis. From out there, that is that the plan? Well, ideally, we'd have both of the the, the locations. When we're doing work during, yeah, when we're doing work during the daytime, still some becomes the the preferred site because the cycle times are, are, are more frequent. And um, but as um, we don't work after ten in that neighborhood for obvious reasons too, so we have to. Um, yeah. Keep in mind, this becomes an issue when Block Eleven is built out point in the future because that's where the majority of our snow storage goes is on block 11. you want to run by that by james yeah. <laughs> i mean it depends on where the trucks are coming from they dump a lot you know i know where they're at we also like don't like to put snow storage anywhere too close to residential because a lot of that occurs at night be very noisy. Do you have any other options? You know, Dick, we've looked at snow melters in the past and, and also, um, you know, just to address snow melters, they're they are prohibitively expensive and kind of go the other direction from our sustainability goals. I mean, you, you burn a lot of diesel to, to, to make heat, so to ultimately True. melt the snow. You know, Vail has an operation where they have a big pit that um, they're able to filtrate a lot of the, the snow melt and then doze it up into a big pile. And I bet if we went over there today, there'd probably still be snow, a mound of snow in there. That site is right on their main, main kind of facility area. We've also looked at that too. Um, there's some additional costs and expenses in just um, dealing with that, that water runoff and how we clean it and filters and as it was said there's a lot of trash um that was a that was a big issue with the snow melter too it was just getting clogged up <coughs> with trash on a on a pretty quick basis i mean all you got to do is go over to stilson right now even and really suck it is hey mark thank thanks for putting this together this really clarifies that whole river corridor why is um why is track 12 that two acre parcel separate from track eight are, and they're both open space, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> I can't remember, Dennis, but uh, I think it may have something to do with we're thinking about putting parking there, yeah. okay. access wow. the open access, space. Parking and access, right? Yeah, um, and just on the open space a little bit, because Kelly touched on it, the intent, we've never gone through like design charrettes to really figure out exactly what we're thinking about there, but what had been discussed is some um, maybe like, single track, maybe pump track, you know, easier um, riding opportunities in a real, one of the flat areas that we have in the whole town, you know, um, in terms of internal to that site. And then as you get closer to the river, then more of a habitat type experience, trying to maintain the habitat along that riparian corridor. Is that for track date? No, for, yeah, for track date, correct. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, I mean, but but it's not set in stone. That's just kind of conceptually some of the things we discuss. Okay. Yeah. I mean, is it time to start exploring a pit type design and see if that's a possibility to help us deal with some of the snow we need to haul? Yeah, Dick, we absolutely can. We can look into that. I don't know that it's going to significantly change kind of what that overall acreage is needed, but it might it might buy back, you know, three to maybe maybe five acres. I think as a kind of as a sum, what public works would, you know, what was now been identified for the next development, that was that was on the order of about 11 acres. And that was seemed to to kind of make sense for what where we're at now and what we could anticipate into the future. But now we're kind of already being reduced from that. Um, Dick, the other thing back in when we mended the master plan a couple of times ago, 
we did actually do an analysis of alternative locations to, for snow storage, and there was just nothing that came. Everything was further away from town. A lot of it, the land we didn't control. So it kind of came back to McKean was the best long-term option. How about S by where the SNR kennel property was? Yeah. Yeah, DNR. Right at the entrance of town. A big old snow pond. Yeah, yeah. See how much snow we've had this year? <laughs> it's a good spot for stables. How many years yeah. ago did we purchase this? Do you know, Rick? Hmm? Yeah. How many years ago did we purchase this? Uh, just the 20, 25 years ago. I was naive enough to think this was all going to be open space then. I think it's longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, had, we can just map it. I'm thinking late 90s. It changed. I mean, I also, I just think it's worth um, talking about. I'm not saying that we should give the nonprofit institutional area less, but I know when we first started talking to them, we were talking two acres, and now I see that we're up to five. And I just think when we're talking about every acre, maybe we just need to know, I don't know, how do we decide? But it's five acres, but an acre and a half of that is the pond, right? Yeah, but it's probably parking. I mean, so it's that's not a complete loss. Potentially parking. Uh, Design parking at the start on the pond. Well, you think we're losing, losing almost two acres with that pond. We're, we've told them that they only have, I believe, 3.8 acres of buildable space, and that includes parking. You need snow storage in the pond. So then they're only losing 1.2 acres. Well, the parking is shared too, so it's more parking that would normally be required for just their facility. So it's for the housing as well. Eric, I don't think that would be something we'd want to do. I mean, I think the optics on that would be poor if we were to, we would want to line that. Um, that is, you know, it's basically groundwater. What is the river going through there? So fill it, right? Oh, I, I'm sorry, Miss. Yeah, I thought. Yeah, no, no. I mean, after we fill it, we could. I mean, track six could be. We. It seems like we could re, re, rethink this and maybe put the nonprofit use. I don't know. It seems like that that's wasted ground. Why wouldn't we waste that ground with snow storage? instead of thinking about six or seven years from now when we can park on it. I think we'd still need to do an engineered fill of some sort, I think, for us to... Well, I think we're planning on doing that yeah. anyway, right? I mean, so... That's a really good point. Might be worth it. Yeah, we should at least... I mean, if we could just it. read... If we could take track six, track 14, and that front part of track four sort of into some thought, and you could use the front part of track four and the institutional piece you know that the the nonprofit can come through track three I mean we can we can redo how the entry is and give them you know would sort of sit behind but so what how many acres would that be then uh well it's it's a couple I mean it's it's talking about really spreading it out I know that's not the best situation for you but you know, it still give you the opportunity to have a couple acres here and there. If you had the seven and a half, a track two, you know, we left some on the airport property. I mean, it's going to be a while before that gets but then you do have mentally built out. But then you do have snow storage near housing. Yeah. Yeah. How impactful would just trucks going in and well, out? You could only put snow there through? during the day. If we do so. Yeah. About any more, about 60% of the operation is at night. Um, we need 10 acres, is that right, of snow storage? On a historic, you know, just on our kind of our normal snow year. I mean, obviously this year wasn't a big year. So we, we actually went out and flew with a drone and it was about seven acres was the, the footprint of this season. But it's been as high as 17 on big, big winters. I mean, maybe track six becomes the public works storage track and track two becomes the nonprofit track. 
portion of it. Don't worry, abortion. James. We're not taking it all. He's abortion. like, ah! just a portion. I mean, that, whatever th three acres of that. I just yeah, just I understand. Swapping. I hate to. I, I will just tell you, I hate to have this this area that you cannot use for anything for a long time. For a long time. Why Why would we plan that when we could use it? Even if it's just a couple acres, we could use it for snow storage. So I think maybe we should think about how how could we possibly make that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the same time, to back to Dick's you know suggestion, we can certainly look at other options and uh, to kind of minimize that footprint of what we potentially um, can can use. Mark, what's the history with the um, track seven for the school? Is that something that's negotiable at all, or yeah, yeah. that is set <laughs> in? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's already been given to them. Yeah, that's what we don't of a land trade we got the property right north of uh, upper blue elementary in exchange how much how much acreage on the dnr kennel site sure i'm a pretty good job i'm thinking like 18 acres but that may be a little how large. about the non-profit the, the non-profit campus there which, which site jeffrey the D non-profit at dnr they wanted it yeah, let the county help close to housing. Oh, it's oh, yeah. zone, right? They'd have to change that, and yeah. they've been very cautious of that because it's what one unit per twenty acres, or one it's one it's a yeah. zone in a way that yes. they were very fearful of because of that corridor, that view coming in, not having you know more than multiple buildings or something along there. I don't know what the rule is, but. I also feel like that's not serving the purpose of the, if we want the nonprofits to be close in town to serve people. Well, actually it's more central to the whole county. That's the problem is there, there has definitely been some discussion of we're putting the nonprofits too close to BRAC and it's not as central as it was. Oh, okay. I have heard that from several people. Yeah. Okay. I feel like maybe since we don't have a clear answer, we just want to say that we like all this stuff, but maybe we can rearrange it. Or maybe you guys can rearrange it to make it all work. Thanks so much. I mean, I think Eric brings a good point. Is is this really the right? And I'm shifting my thoughts on it, you know, because is is track six is that really the right use when we have two acres of non-usable land in, in here? You know, is that a better fit for snow storage, material storage, you know, that kind of stuff? I think material storage, I, I, again, I worry about the housing being so close. I live right next to material storage, as long as there's enough buffer. Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm saying I mean, it's okay with, yeah. I'm, I'm okay with material storage. I mean, Stilson is in the middle of a residential area. And, but Very what about the snow? people even know it's there. There's snow storage on Stilson too. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, there's yeah. just enough buffer that it's. But if we've used part of track two for, Snow storage. Did you, you, would you use that far enough away from housing to use to use that at night? I'm going to say, you know, yes. I mean, right now on Block 11, for instance, there's there's residential units on there, and we're we're in that kind of that same yeah. distance. And I won't say we don't get phone calls, but we don't we don't get many. Okay. So. James, in your ideal world, where would you put snow storage here? <laughs> In Riverwalk. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'd leave it on Block 11, but I know that that's not not a complete option. Some of the things that we're talking about as we're going out here, there's just long longer trip trips in this, so we're burning more fuel. There's more, you know, wear and tear on the vehicles. There's it just kind of puts a prolongs the whole operation and which drives some of the cost, honestly. But um, but I also know that that's not entirely an option, so. Anywhere closest to the roads where we we gain access, you know, so Stan Miller would be, would be the best. And also, we have those that to, to the to the south <clears throat> where that landscaping company is. They're going to be gone. I don't know what track is that? Is that two? Two, yeah. So that's that could change the configuration. Yeah, ideally, that's that's the area that would be kind of best. You know, to Eric's point about you know, still some being somewhat cryptic back there. Yeah. There's a lot of tree buffer in that area. So it'd be nice to kind of be able to have a location where it wouldn't be that visible. And 
you know, it is next adjacent to the highway too, so it wouldn't. Well, and that's where, you know, even if you allowed a very limited snow storage on eight, you know, I mean, he could, you know, he could go just a little bit, he could, you know, go a little farther with track two if he had to extend it, but still mm -hmm. behind some tree buffers to the south yep. a little bit and stuff like that. Um, and as a last resort, there could be an identified area in that southeast corner of uh, that is mostly gravel, um, you know, farther away from the river and that on, on eight potentially yep. where it could <clears throat> be for heavy winters or something like that where we would the overflow have, having some, you know, the last it, it would be used as a last resort type thing if we need limited. So. <clears throat> Um, while I hear what you're saying, I'm, you know, the, the nonprofit one is a funny one because we're, we've really been trying to play off the, uh, um, the dynamics of the, all of the, you know, 300 units of workforce housing intertwined with a very service oriented nonprofit center. And and also using a shared parking model because they need more parking during the day. The lodging needs more at night, right? When they don't. So we were going to save on space and parking space by sharing. And that those are certainly some of the dynamics of the of those people being co-located next to each other there. Um, what you're saying about that Deng Pond. Mm -hmm. We you know, we've kind of just blown that pond off as, as you know, two acres that are going to serve as a nice entryway, open space, landscaped area as you pull in there, because it's going to be the most visible thing as you're pulling into that, that whole area. Ooh. Which is nice, too. Yeah, it is. It is, but it's tough. It's tough when we're limited on space. Totally, to but just throw two acres away as just that's a nice entryway. Right, which it will still be nice in the summer, right? Like we don't well, need once it. Once it gets cleaned up, I mean. But I haven't heard James say that. It, you know, number one, if you're okay with us giving notice that in, you know in three to five years that 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 uh, there's no more service commercial going on in track two, that's a big relief for us yeah. we, you know, that gives us a lot more flexibility in meeting our needs and so I, I think that as long as we have that with two and we and we continue to utilize and look at Stilson I haven't heard great concern that we we can't hopefully this would meet our needs yeah I think I think if we were able to to identify a couple spots last resort we could go to on a heavy winter on, on the larger track, right? Correct, correct. I mean, th there are some options, um, you know, in a big winter week, in years past, we've rented a snow cat and dozed it up and, you know, created a, a new- Sled hill? <laughs> well, it's, again, it's kind of, <laughs> the snow's not very nice. No. That, that we're, That's true. Yeah. So there are some options, but two bricks, I would agree with that. <laughs> I mean, there, there is the opportunity to move that road too. The, the pond could be on the south or on the east side of the road. That road doesn't exist yet. So you could you could separate some of those uses with that road as you design this out. That road is not a static. Yeah. I mean, it might be more expensive to put a, you know, to bend it around like that, but it would it would serve as a separator between that potential two acre piece. Yes. Yeah. That part's kind of designed going that way to the north. But I think you're talking about taking looping it up into up around the pond there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I do think we can move. I don't live there yet. Hey, Rick, um, the private property to the south of the treatment plant, that's the bunkhouse in Snowbridge. And is there anything else in there? 
That's that's a Tetro property in Tetro. Yes, no bridge. Yeah, except the, the bunkhouse. That's a separate parcel. And there, I know they have their plant back there, but I'm not visioning. Do they use all of the property for their operation, for their Snowbridge operation? It, where I'm going is, could we approach them about possibly trying to purchase some of that? Not sure how to answer this one, but um, I think they have a plan for development. They've they've had several conversations with us about um, wanting to to get under our water in the future. I think obviously Snowbridge is to answer the question. I guess they use all the property to to my knowledge. I've been on there a few times and and seen their operation. I think when some previous conversations with whether it's Cheryl or Bill, I think they've they have a plan someday to, to, to develop that. Is there any density on that? It's in the county. Oh, okay. Yeah. So as part of that agreement. Is in the county? Uh, so they're. I was just curious. I don't know how open they would be to any kind of. That mess. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, I think the takeaway is let's try to come up with some solutions that, you know, I think track eight. You can't touch. Obviously, track three you can't no. do anything with, and track seven you can't touch. But everything else, I think, is. I think we'd be willing to look at any <clears throat> option for the stuff in the middle, right? Everybody sort of agree with that. Yeah. And Eric, I think we talked in Halsey. We might be able to push seven a little bit to the south, if need be, right? Or well, that's going to be a bigger deal than I thought. Is it by okay. six? Yeah, because it's. I mean, they own it. It's. There we'd yeah. have to do it. It's already platted, yeah. Well, track four already has solar on it too, right? We can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but if, if that's only got another 15 year life, I mean, that's going to be. Well, they said it's probably a little longer than that, but yeah. But still, it will eventually become 20. snow storage. We should just snow storage down track <laughs> seven. What is the plan for track seven with the school district? What are they? What's their plan for it? They have, there's no plan. Right what now. if we could lease that oh, for snow good. storage until, yeah. the, until which time they want to build on it? That's, that's a, actually a pretty good thought because that might be 20. Or a housing. Do we have that here? Yeah. Yeah. It is well, no, they, it's, un, it's unspecified. They didn't know what they were going to do. That was a, I don't know if Carol knew this. This is a trade we made for acreage right next to Upper Blue, which is mm -hmm. next to a property that we have. So that's why we made that swap. And there's no, yeah, historically the school boards have never really wanted to do much with their land, but you know, this is a new board and there's yep. going to be another new board. I need to check that agreement. We might have put something in there, Dick. You said something about it. Well, that's, that would be good. Well, if we're long term planning, that would be a temporary solution. And right. what I'm hearing from James is we're going to have more and more snow removal needs and we need to yeah, plan this winter. out. Yeah. It will be developed out at some point. <laughs> With the life of the solar are close. Oh, that's true. Okay. You know, so that, that might bring some options. That might be worth approaching them. Sure. Are you glad? Vacation from the council then. Is it the consensus of the council to remove the snow storage altogether from track eight? Yes. It is a last resort in some areas. It's a small area as a last resort for a big heavy year. I might be open to, you know, that a couple acres, you know, that yeah. area, you know, east of uh, or uh, south of two and seven. You glad you came? <laughs> the good news is we have a lot of land to work with. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but they're not making any more of it. No. Oh. You crop it out on your own? It feels like just shy of 10 acres. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Got enough to come up with something? Yep. Thank no. you. Sorry, sorry. Thank enough, you. To, enough to give you nightmares. Uh, special event rules and regulations amendment. Um, so, Council, in the packet, I have a memo I hope that um, highlights the substantive changes in the SEPA rules and regulations. Um, I included just some timeline in there. If Council doesn't have any changes, or if you do, we'll make those changes. Um, and then it will be posted.
for a period of time, it would not go into effect until two weeks after this evening. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And just again, um, I would just wanna highlight the work of the SEPA group and Sarah Wetmore at the BTO in particular, um, because she was a great help to me in trying to nail down all of these changes, not only in this document, but also in the ordinance that you approved previously. Thank you, Shannon. Questions? She's, she's good. I have a question. Uh, has Jesse weighed in on our language around recycling and composting and, and all of that, our requirements for the special events? Language that you see in there that re, um, refers to recycling and waste, <coughs> that is all Jesse. Great. <coughs> she's nice right. Shannon. And Sarah, I know. Well team. done. A lot of work went into this, and you can tell. It's really well done. Thank you. Okay, Please, Sarah. Yeah, please do listen. Okay, Rick, you want to do some <coughs> other stuff before we um, do exec session? We're going to have a lot in exec session. You want to just we go to it? it? Okay. We should go in into exec session, I think, sooner than later. Let's make the motion. Very good. I move that town council go into executive section pursuant to paragraph 4A of section 246402 CRS relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or <coughs> sale of any real personal or other property interest and paragraph 4F of section 246402 CRS relating to personal matters. Is there a second? Second. A motion has been made for the town council to go into an executive session pursuant to paragraph 4A, section 246402 CRS, relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest. Paragraph 4F, section 246402 CRS, relating to personnel matters. Subjects of the executive session include land that the town council may have an interest in purchasing and be the process for filling the town attorney position. Roll call, please. Here. Sade? Here. Yellow? Yes. Mr. Carlton? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mr. Poon? Yes. Mayor Mamula? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You are unmuted. We're unmuted. So they don't bother. Okay. So <laughs> um, we're Hunter, back in session. We need to make a decision. We uh, Park City has reached out, as you know, when we went to the MT 2030 conference a few years ago, we had volunteered to say Summit County would like to host the next one. Well, then um, COVID hit. And so but they would really like to see the conference come back either late May or early June of 2022. They reached out to us and said, Summit County, do you still want to do it? Um, they, their intent is for that, that Park City group 
this kind of group will take the lead on the agenda and the speakers, which is good. That relieves some of the stuff. We'd be more of a host site here. Uh, the commissioners yesterday uh, weighed in and said they would still like to participate in, you know, with whoever in the county wants to do it. So um, while I think you know, we were tossing around some pretty big numbers before when we did this, trying to really go out and get these high-end speakers. I I have no idea what that cost is going to be. My guess is it's going to be 100 to 150 at least for us to do this, but it will bring a lot of people into town. Um, it's going to be very close to a big conference we're going to have anyways, because the 100th anniversary of CML is going to be here in June of 22. Yeah. But that's going to be a big one. Um, but, you know, we're going to need to hire whether it's Carol Craig or somebody to help take a lead and do some of this stuff like we were going to do before. What's the council's preference? What's our see? split with the county? Would it be mostly in Breck and we pay for most of it? Or? I mean, I think. Yeah, we, we wanted to have most of it in Breck, and that was always the goal because we have the facilities that, that and so. Is the county in agreement with us? Yeah. We're before. When would we pick? May, early June. That's really good. It's not, I think the money's not, it, to me, my my only apprehension would be, uh, you know, the additional work and with staff, we're down staff doing it. I, but I think we can, I think we can pull it off. Uh, you know, we'll spend a little, if we get somebody to come in and help us with the organization, you know, Jesse is gonna be on FML, FML for, the, you know, three months coming up here, so. Uh, she won't be available, but if you think it's still something you'd like to see here, then we'll we'll work on it. What do you guys think? So that's a year, basically a year away. Yeah. yeah. I would really like to see it. I mean, I, I am concerned about staff. I think that we are running them really hard. So, you know, as much as we can rely on our partners like HC3 and um, the other towns and county, but I feel like we really need to refocus on some environmental goals because the last year and a half has Run kind of yeah. railroaded things. So very similar. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The only thing I would say um, different is could we ask them to push it to the fall? Get it away from CML. Well, and plus we show so much better in the fall than, oh, yeah. than May. That's May true. is just not a great time to be here. And we can ask here. Yeah. Doesn't hurt to ask, right? Yeah. All you had to do was ask. And I'd say we say yes, we're in. Um, it'd be great if we could push it to the fall because we have another we have another big event going on. And, and there's more stuff to do. I mean, we'd like to have some bike rides and some other yeah. Yeah. you know environment. We'd like to show the town off in our trail system. And May's just a tough time to do that. Uh -huh. What would that be? Early September, late August? What? Yeah, or, yeah, early September, early mid September. Also, from a sustainability front, it could snow in May, which makes it harder to walk around yeah. and that sort of thing, and waiting for buses and whatnot. All right. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, possibly. Talking. It was the fall. Yeah. So, we'd like to do similar time of year. I think they were just thinking the sooner the better, but I agree with you. It's definitely. And it would probably be more here. We're yeah. closer to the metro, you know. Um, what else you got, Rick? There will be a CAST Colorado Association of Ski Towns meeting in Telluride August 26th and 27th. That's a Thursday and Friday. Eric typically goes with us. Sometimes other Dick is gone. I think he's expressed an interest in wanting to go. Um, to tell you right, uh, Carol's expressed an interest. Is anybody else going to have an interest in wanting to go? 
uh, to tell you, we need to know sooner than later because we have to make room reservations. We'd be there. We'd be leaving early Thursday morning so we could get there by noon. We'd want to get there by noon. I have to be at a noon meeting. Uh, the session will start around two, I believe. And then there's a, you know, a reception and dinner that night. And then we don't head back until noon. I think on Friday we head back. So you'd be back by Friday evening. Go Wednesday to Friday? No. Thursday. We'd leave Thursday morning. We'd just be one night. Unless some of us left early. You could if you wanted. The rooms aren't cheap, I'll tell you that. Well, I mean, I'd pay for my own room if I went early. Yeah, there. What are the dates then? 26th and 27th of August. Uh, you don't have to tell me now, but let me know soon. I'm in. Uh, um, Put on your calendar, we'll send out a note. We're gonna do what's called the housing action initiative countywide. It was started off as a housing summit, but it's gonna be called the housing action initiative made up of all of the towns and the county and the elected officials that wanna participate. There'll be developers, large employers, et cetera, all meet. And we're gonna do it at Beaver Run for uh, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Wednesday, July 21st, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And it's all about identifying housing opportunities and what are the steps we got to do and the partners to say, let's create work groups and how do we make things happen? So we're, <coughs> hoping, we're hoping to walk out of there with a half a dozen housing ideas that we can go uh, to work. What was the about date? 125 Baldo? people will have there. What was the date on that? July 21st. I'll have, I, I'm giving you a little heads up and I'll have Peyton follow up okay. tomorrow with uh, notes on all this. Come stuff. in and sit down. This is normal meeting stuff. We're just, we're just shorting our meeting tonight. So have a seat. Make yourselves at home. And Rick, that's in the county, you said? Uh huh? No, it's going to be a Beaver Run. Run. Well, in the yeah. kingdom, buddy. <laughs> oh, uh, gracious. A week from today, <laughs> on the 29th of June, a week from today, Dola. Uh, Department of Local Affairs is going to be at the BOCC meeting at 2 p.m. to discuss housing and housing grants and opportunities. So I, Eric's going to try to go over there. I'll be there. Shannon, I'll probably go over there. If anybody else wants to go a week from today, BOCC. I talked about the Lizzie Load already, and uh, the Mark already wrote that letter. Mark, do you, is there any way to us? Putting our names on a letter to the BOCC about that, or okay, and we'll we'll all sign off on it. Okay, that'd be great. Um, I'll let you all know that um, Shannon Haynes is now officially a Summit Foundation board member. Yay. Yes, yes. Of them recognizing her leadership in the county and, and she's really there and serving as a, a town of Breck representative on, on the Summit Foundation board. And it was not a quick process. It took a while. So <laughs> her and uh, being on there. We're, we, uh, we're going to be, we're looking at a permit, an application that's been made for a logging operation that's going to be um, removing a large amount of trees that will involve about 200 truck loads of logging trees coming out uh, up above Warriors Mark. And they'll have to, Mark will be, uh, we have a permit because they have to access across a private park, a, par a private lot. And so it's a driveway access has to be created. They've got permission from the property owner, but I just want you to know we'll be working with them to control the usage on town streets. So we'll have, we'll be looking at certain conditions relative to weight. Obviously we have concerns about weight uh, on the roadways and any bridges they go over. We'll have concern. We'll, We'll have conditions on noise. We'll have conditions on hours of operation, days of operation. Um, you know, that air brakes, we don't want air brakes used in the town. Um, When's this happening, Rick? This could start in July. <laughs> Several months process. Is it wildfire mitigation or? Yeah. 
Forest Service and uh, part of you know one A strong futures. That's gonna be awesome. Right. Um, <coughs> same fires all over the place. You got to get that stuff done. Yeah, I know, I know. And they'll they'll be a little. I'm sure it's not going to be pleasant for some of the homeowners where it passes by. But you know, we'll try to. You know, when you lives out there. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just wanted you to have a heads up on that. Um, and that's another thing that part of the our this permit approval will be. We're going to require them to do public outreach. So. Not a fun project. Sorry. All right, that's all I have. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, we got a bid to do a short-term rental nexus study. By that, I mean we were gonna, the company that did the housing needs assessment for us has given us a bid to to come in and do a study to show a connection between the increase in short-term rentals and the loss of, of long-term housing options. Town or county wide? Uh, it would be focusing on the upper blue for us. <laughs> then the town of Frisco is looking to partner with us okay. on this. So tell us how the impact to increased need for employees it will have a uh, part of what they're proposing <laughs> uh, the more units you are the more Greater, or, or the more people that come here, the more economic impact of guests, short-term rental, rental visitor spending. Um, the document, the rational and proportional relationship between short-term rental impacts, fee collected and service provided, quality impact of STR guests. So the, all the people that are here in short-term rentals, um, What's that impact on the house, housing and service demand? And so it's not about their employee generation. Okay. This is, so we're looking at this as uh, the groundwork to lay the foundation for a fee proposal. <clears throat> okay. Right. So we can make a nexus between the fee that we want to do and what we're using that fee for. What's the timing, right? I've told them I'd really like to have it in the next 90 days um, because that's, you know, I'm, I think it's premature. We were going to have a discussion even tonight, today with you guys about uh, this fee, but I think you need, I think we need more background. I think we need some of this work done. I think we're okay if our goal still looks at trying to get something implemented by January 1. I'd also like keep an eye, keep our eye on cast and see what other resort towns are doing. Yeah, oh, we will. Well, I'm sure that'll be a big subject of conversation at this next meeting. But um, right now, the proposed cost of this is, you know, give or take, it's around thirty-five grand. And uh, like I said, I'm hoping that Frisco would split some of that cost with us. But I don't think we have a choice if we're going to look at this thing. I think we got to move on something like this. I'm all for it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to mention this and just sort of get a head nod to you all real quick. But um, you know the air states doing block parties around um, town. There is one planned for uh, Paris Street uh, between Lincoln and Washington. The original intent was to have it in one of the parking lots but they'd like to actually close um, Paris from those two side streets to really truly make it more of a block party. Um, and those are all sponsored by a resident. Um, and part of that, part of the requirement to be able to close the road is that all the residents who live in that space have to be there. Um, and I just wanted to give you a heads up on it because road closures are very sensitive and they didn't want 
surprised by that if you did something like this. When, when, when you wrote the quotes, yeah. It's more like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there might be a little bit of loading. There's only homes on one side, and half, most of them have alley access, except for, like, what, Gallagher? I mean, if they're all fine, if the homes are all fine with it, then. Yeah. What's I'm the fine. date? The 22nd of July, I believe. She's she said yes. Shaking yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. You said yes. Harris Street, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm good with it. Don't bump. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, anything else, Rick? <laughs> Um, <laughs> you get one minute. <laughs> uh, we didn't have cast or MMC. What did I have? Did I do some? Oh, we had coffee talk, which was great. We had a great turnout for those of you who were here. There, Dennis went. Carol went. Kelly went. I went. Um, great turnout. Great questions. It was nice to do it. We're gonna do them every month again. Third Friday in July um, is the next plan. Is the next one that. Um, Peyton is looking at that's the 16th and that would be with the scariest. So Jody would show up and we'd talk about stuff with them. So it was great though. It was great to see there were some new people there, people that had just moved to town during the pandemic. And it was really um, good questions. And that face-to-face -face is such a great way for us to uh, head off issues with community. So it was awesome. <laughs> Uh, open space, anything? Oh boy, yeah. We had an open house. Um, that was great. Thank you for everyone who came. Um, we, it was the same, uh, the same way we've done it before, where we had the little stations and people talk. Um, so that was good. And then we had another BOSAC meeting last night with the DTJ design consultants that we are hiring to help us with the master plan, and it was. A good long meeting. They they asked BOSAC questions, and BOSAC had the opportunity to ask them questions. Um, so we talked about some of the the planning process for collecting information. Um, and right now, obviously, we're, they're in the information gathering stage um, in order to start forming the vision and, and the scope of the project. Um, the process is iterative and incrementally getting tighter and more focused. The next steps will include one-on-one -on -one interviews, surveys, uh, which may include trail intercept surveys. We talked a little bit about the surveys that were included in the, um, the quandary uh, write-up that we had, the, the quandary memo, so, so similar things like that. Um, some workshops and open houses, so they'll attack it from different ways. Um, with a company called Civic Brand, which will really help them out with uh, connecting with people in different ways. So that was something that um, Scott and Ann wanted me to bring up was that the fact that we will be looking at a survey over the summer and they will take that temperature about whether there is survey fatigue and, and attack it from different angles. Uh, we're also planning on developing video clips, highlighting some common values around open space to help encourage people to be part of this. And also on the other end, once these um, these plans are developed to also help people get on board with the, the common values and, and things like that. So it was really good, good conversation. Awesome, thank you. Uh, tourism, Dr. Kuhn. I, we had a board meeting last Thursday and I left all my notes at home. So I apologize Thanks for that. No so worries. I thought Lucy was here, but. All right, we'll get it from her later then. How about um, uh, Heritage? On the BHA, the BHA is uh, working on their draft budget for 2022, getting updated bids for projects that got pulled from the April 2020, from April 2020, so they can use the accurate information to determine um, what we come to town with for 2022. Um, I don't know if anybody saw it, but the letter written by Barney Ford to his enslavers in 1848 was reprinted in the Summit Daily on Juneteenth. It was cool. Oh, yeah. cool. And then um, the BHA is considering a name change. Um, they're taking a hard look at its name and considering alternatives that resonate more with visitors, guests, not just locals who already know them as the BHA, um, and the name that implies inclusivity versus an alliance. 
Um, they've got a, a list of names and they're going to go through it and then get back with us. ECA is not one of them. BH. Um, that's all I've got. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, creative <clears throat> arts. Well, we're we're starting some smaller meetings in finance on budget, but uh, that that starts Friday. Great. But we uh, did see the air stage in action. It was cool. We went to the air stage opening. It was awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yes. And the band was really pretty awesome. It was. And there was cupcakes, which. Oh, cupcakes. That's, yeah, where were you? Were cupcakes, I was, uh, dude. I was out of town. I've been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very smoothly. Looked really cool. Yeah, last week, too. I missed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, events? We have not had any. Child care. Haven't we? Workforce housing committee. Anything to add? No, Chloe covered it. She covered it. And social equity. We had a great meeting. It was our first in person and um, spent a lot of time and energy um, batting around mission, vision statements and uh, the equity lens. Um, it, you know, made a lot of progress, but didn't quite get there. But wow, what a great group. They were all, all awesome on Zoom and even better in person. Ooh, that's good. Carol, I'm sure you have something to add. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The meetings are always open to the public. Um, and uh, I think uh, did get a great job at the beginning, just kind of re-talking about exactly what an advisory commission does and what is that role. Um, just a few of our um, commissioners haven't served on a commission before. So I think it was great to set the stage there. and. I couldn't echo more how wonderful the discussion was. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, we just have a couple minutes till we get started. So smoke them if you got them. Wow. <laughs> Nobody says we'll that. Go to the kitchen and get a bus tub. <laughs> okay. I think you're going to go get some cookies and bring it. No. <laughs> I'll get the cookies. I'll tell you that. Are you going to bring all the cookies? No, I'm just going to get. Hello? Is that a hint? We have two minutes. Bring our plates. We have yeah. water. Maybe, maybe, I don't think it's a bad idea. There's water right here. Well, there, I drank most of it. Shannon, I'm happy to take a. Why did who took the streets Shannon. and parks hat? This girl. Oh, yeah. that, that's streets and parks. That was an example, not a.
That's just took a half of so. that. Uh, you want the cookie? Hey, Kelly. I call to order the June twenty second regular town council meeting to order. Roll call, please. Ms. Sade here. Mr. Carlton here. Mr. Bergeron here. Ms. Owens here. Mr. Coon here. Ms. Giello here. Mayor Mamula yes. Uh, we have town council minutes for June eighth, twenty twenty one. Any anybody got a problem with them? Anybody good with them? All right. Minutes stand as presented. Approval of the agenda, Rick. Mayor, under. Um, Resolutions will be doing, we'll be adding a resolution. You got it wrong, didn't you? Yeah, I thought it was a question. Number? We'll be adding resolution number 15, a resolution establishing a local bid preference policy in connection with the award of town construction contracts. Will be resolution B12, we'll add a second resolution. You uh, get us that language so I can read it when I get to it. I'm not going to remember it. I can put it up on the screen. Thank you. All right. We move to citizens' comments. These are non agenda items only, three minute time limit, please. Anybody in the audience here for public comment? None. Citizens' comment is closed. And we start with a Breckenridge Ski Resort update with our new best friend. Cooler than Bueller. Oh, way cooler oh. than Bueller. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting buttons, man. <laughs> I'm going to tell myself. Welcome, Jody. Thanks for so much. And it was really nice to spend some time with you all today and get to know you and um, see the beautiful parking structure. That was amazing and really um, grateful that you guys invited me. So thank you for that. As you know, my name is Jody Churich. I am the new COO, Vice President of Breckenridge Ski Resort. I came all the way over from Keystone where I've just spent the last two seasons. Um, it's been an exciting journey for me and I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, prior to joining Keystone, um, I was the Senior Director at Park City Mountain and oversaw that program for just under a year. Uh, prior to that, I was the chief operating officer for Woodward. Um, we're all watching to see how that does not spill. <laughs> <Nice work. laughs> Way more exciting than my LinkedIn resume. Um, so that's kind of where I came from. I spent my whole career in the ski business for the exception of the time I was with Woodward where I um, diverted and went to action sports for six years. So uh, I am a gender disruptor. I was one of the first female GMs in the industry, um, same time as Pat Campbell, actually. Um, and I was running to smaller ski resorts in California and North Lake Tahoe called Boreal and Soda Springs. So that's kind of where I've come from. I'm really excited. This is my second Summit County that I've lived in in Park City. I lived in Summit County as well. Um, just really excited to be here and thank you all for inviting me tonight. Um, and I want to just tell you a little bit about um, what's going on at Breckenridge and, you know, as we're talking about diversity, um, equity and inclusion. In Colorado, there are five ski resorts um, that Vail owns and operates and four of them are run by women, which I'm really proud to say I'm one of. So really exciting for our company and really feel as though Vail has continually been just way out in front in that area um, and just really proud to be a part of growing women in leadership. So that's something that I'm really passionate about and excited to continue on um, as we move forward. So I do did bring my glasses. I don't want to forget any details on the update. I'm exactly 14 days into my new role. So um, don't want to miss out on any of them. Uh, as you all know, Breckenridge had a really nice long season, opened, stayed opened, and we were open until May 23rd, which was really, really commendable um, given all the circumstances this year. Um, I would say the same for Keystone. We were really proud to get open and stay open and extended a week. So really excited that we as a company really made it happen. And um, in challenging times, right, we were all in this together and we couldn't have done it without the town. 
the county um, and all of public health. And I, I say that genuinely, like it was a partnership through and through. We couldn't have done it without each other. So really awesome season um, to get through it together. And um, we've got a lot going on at Breckenridge. We have the new Peak 7 chairlift going in and that redistribution of, of our, our guests will be amazing in the coming season. We're right on track. Things are moving forward. Um, we also open for summer. So that was on day four for me. Um, I'm, I'm, I've got a trend going. When I joined Keystone, I landed on in October and we opened four days later. So this four day thing is kind of happening for me. Um, so we, uh, we opened this weekend. Um, it was great. We have our peak eight base camp um, activities open the coaster, the slide. Um, we hope to get Colorado chair up to our Alpine camp um, before the 4th of July. So that's kind of what we're on target for. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, we're also just really grateful to be back in business and really keeping the flow and the tourism coming to this area. So really great there. Um, definitely want to touch on something that's really exciting and that Vail just announced a $15 minimum wage. Um, really big uh, out in front and just really doing what we can to continue to um, keep the vibrancy and our employees coming through and excited to come and work. Um, so I think that was a, a big and exciting announcement that we had this week um, or last week, I think. The other thing that just came out most recently is the climate, um, the climate uh, collaborative charter that we've gone into partnership with Boyne, Altera, Powder Corp, um, and Vail Resorts, and really a collaborative to really focus on climate action. And I just don't want to get these details incorrect, but as you know, we've made significant progress toward our sustainability goals within Vail, reaching um, uh, a net zero operating footprint by 2030. So we recently achieved our 50% weight diversion milestone and will be at 93% powered by renewable electricity by 2023. So just amazing to be in a space where we're really taking a lead role. Um, the other thing I wanted to really put a lens on that I'm excited about, and that is that Rob Katz um, in the Katz Amsterdam Foundation just donated $29.3 million to um, uh, racial justice. And so it's just amazing to see what kind of um, things that they are doing in this space. As you know, they donate a, a lot of money to mental health and support in these areas, including our community. So amazing things going on. Um, that is truly my update. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but just really looking forward to being a, a great partner for this town, um, the town of Brack, and to, to be there with you guys through whatever we get thrown our way, right? We've done it and we'll do it whatever comes our way. Thanks, Jody. Any questions? No. Okay. Welcome. Welcome, yeah. Thanks for coming. Great to have Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks for showing up tonight. Uh, Breck Creative Arts Update. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Tamara uh, with Breckenridge Creative Arts. And um, just a couple of updates. Uh, you already heard a little bit from Dick. We have a lot of, going, of activity going on in what feels like the first week of summer, at least for us. Um, the NRO arrived with their 46 musicians um, and are rehearsing and filling the Riverwalk Center with, with orchestral music, which is terrific. Uh, we also launched our drive-in movie series with Breck Film and look forward to two more um, coming up here with in partnership with BOEC this weekend. So that's terrific. And also this week is a big week for us. There are two really uh, things that I'd like to talk about tonight. And the first of which is the Colorado Creative District recertification process. So I just wanted to say thank you to Rick and to Lucy for providing letters of support for that. Um, the redistricting process uh, allows our uh, core of town stretching from the Riverwalk Center through the historic cultural buildings on the Arts District campus at Ridge Street um, to, to really create a hub for 
creative entrepreneurs and artists um, so that we can continue to have an innovative economy that is, is diverse and um, enlivens that heart of the town. Um, so this uh, process goes begins uh, tomorrow and goes through the end of the, the summer. And we look forward to hosting the Colorado Tourism Office and uh, having all of our materials dialed in um, so that we can show how much employment the arts truly does uh, generate here and how much business and economic impact um, our district in particular has. Um, and as a part of that, uh, we are, you know, really kind of dialing into our foundation um, as we look to the budget process and what our core purpose is at Breckenridge Creative Arts. Um, and to me, it is really to manage uh, the, the physical assets there on the, the creative district stretch and to program, ensure that those are programmed appropriately, relevantly, innovatively, um, spectacularly with, um, with our partnerships that we engage in through other cultural organizations that exist here in, in the community um, and also with our own programming. And so that's something fundamental, especially since now we are really back to basics at Recreate, um, as we are 46% of our staff that we had in 2019. So while we are looking to, um, to start the rebuilding process, that is going to be a challenge as we are impacted by all of the, the landscape issues that our community is feeling here as well. Um, and, you know, as a cult, as a cultural and creative district, um, one of our obligations um, is to nurture that creative community of artists and entrepreneurs. Um, and we are expected to do that in order to gain all of the resources and benefits that the state offers um, to our community in terms of, of helping us publicize and, um, and make sure that the infrastructure is there to, to manage it. And so uh, one of the, the, the programs that we're launching, as you've heard, is our uh, block parties this week. And that our first launch of the block party is um, really supported by our private partnerships with Breck Music um, and a residency with Youth on Record. And I have here with me today a guest, uh, Stefan Brackett, who is the governor appointed Colorado music ambassador for the state, as well as program director for Youth on Record. And so we're really excited to launch this program of block parties, which is intended to be hyper local um, for our communities. Thank you for, for closing down uh, Harris Street for us. Um, and I wanted to invite Stefan just to say a few words about the impact of block parties. Um, this was truly inspired by um, Youth on Record, the organization, and a pretty uh, long-term program down in Denver that uh, focuses on engaging youth, connecting neighbors through music and art, and um, putting our air stage into action. So, Stefan, please. Uh... Thank you all so much for having me. Um, it is actually really cool and really fascinating to be able to sit here, even through your meetings, uh, just to see the things that line up and contrast with the stuff in Denver. And it is actually really refreshing to see how quickly we all get through an agenda, I gotta tell you what. <laughs> um, so uh, not to try to make your agenda longer, um, along the lines of what is happening now, um, it is so valuable when you bring music to a community. There are a lot of gates oftentimes between where the arts normally happen and where the people are, or unintended chasms between people being able to get there. So when we started doing our block parties, we specifically did it in the neighborhood where we found that almost nobody went. And in doing so, we found that that actually got to build a bridge of connection and of like value and important placemaking, starting from the place where we were and then radiating outwards. When people were coming to that spot, they were also able to see what it was. And the people who lived there were also able to present and be proud of that area. Um, and especially at this point in time, I've heard this brought up so many times already, we are coming out of a, a crisis. We are coming out of a tragedy. And the arts and music, as you all who went to the uh, air stage opening, 
being able to see Rob Drabkin play and be able to connect just in that easy way that music makes it possible is very healing. So when we were working with Breck Music on the idea of bringing the block party here, um, we were incredibly excited, um, not just because of the different ways certain people are highlighted and other folks are sublimated in this community, just like any other, but then also knowing that they have the creative vision trying to make that bridge. And when that bridge is made, I think we get to see something really beautiful. And at this point in time, what a more wonderful way for that to happen. I think it speaks volumes that you have the community member saying, yes, please bring music to my community, inconvenience my drive for a few hours because that would be beautiful. So I really just wanna celebrate Tamara's vision. Um, and I wanna celebrate you all for also having that vision and being able to say like, yes, that sounds like a wonderful idea. Um, the last bit of information I'll say is that though in Colorado, we seem to be doing very well with the pandemic, there is a second pandemic that the Children's Hospital just recently released saying that our young people are out of resilience. Our young people are absolutely suffering now. But then another paper that came out in Newark, New Jersey from another study said, the arts are one of the best ways to build that back up. So I'm also very excited to be with a group of musicians from all over the state of Colorado who are bringing this to our young people so they can dance in the celebration of their own creation. And then we can dance literally in the streets as a celebration of our connection. So thank you for your vision, Tamara. Thank you for having me. Cool. I just want to Kelly. say one thing because Tamara reminded me, but Jody, thank you to Vail for helping with the NRO housing. That was a really huge thing that made their season possible. Yes. And I'm looking forward to dancing in the streets. I want to see that. I want to see that, woman. I will make a special little area. Upper Blue Elementary School, Friday night, six o'clock. It starts with a solidarity talk as well. So Great. we hope to see you there. Awesome. More moves and X-Lax. <laughs> so, so yeah. so, thank you. Thank you. Upper Blue at six o'clock. <clears throat> so at six o'clock and the solidarity talk starts at four with Alexandria and um, Stefan will be facilitating the evening with a community call and response. Um, share it with your networks. Um, Stefan's also the lead singer of the Flowbots, but we'll welcome Iskali, Mexican rock group and the Reminders, which are an awesome, um, have a great message, a lot of Afro folk indie um, spoken word as a part of it. So it should be really inspiring and we're honored to do that work. Great. Thank you. Have a great Thank night. You. Okay. Right. Uh, first reading of council bills. We have council bill number 16. Series 2021. This is an ordinance amending section 9-1-5 Breckenridge Town Code known as the Town of Breckenridge Development Code concerning the measurement of building height in floodplain areas and land use districts 31 and 40. Oh, reading. Totally skip that. Second reading. Damn it, and I got to read that again, don't I? Second reading of Council Bill number 15, Series 2021, an ordinance approving a lease with Summit County Youth Hockey, Inc. This ordinance, if adopted, would uh, approve the lease. It's attached to the ordinance. Um, it's uh, for space at the ICE Arena. It, the term of the lease with the options will extend longer than one year, and by our code, that requires an ordinance approval. Uh, Scott Reed gave the council a nice explanation two weeks ago of the deal points. There have been no changes to the deal points or to the ordinance itself from first reading. Thank you, Tim. Uh, any questions for Tim? No, anyone in the public wish to comment on this for second reading this evening? The public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? Well, second reading, move we pass council bill number 15, series 2021, the title which has been read into the record. I'd just like to add one comment if I yes, could. Yes, please. Um, saw the director of Summit Hockey this morning, Chris uh, Miller, and he's very, very appreciative of the town continuing to work and, and feels like, you know, the dry land program is really, really um, taking off now and lots of kids participating. So great. Thanks, Dick. Yep. Uh, is there a second? Second. Yeah. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Cream. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Ms. Sade. 
Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mayor Manuela. Yes. Okay, now we have first reading. Council Bill number 16, series 2021. This is an ordinance amending section 9-1-5, the Breckenridge Town Code, known as the Town of Breckenridge Development Code, concerning the measurement of building height in floodplain areas and land use districts 31 and 43. Mr. Truckee. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon or good evening. Um, so this ordinance would be a change for the way we measure height when uh, you have a situation where a structure is placed in the floodplain. It is already required to be elevated one foot above the floodplain elevation. So in cases where it's in the floodplain, sometimes there's a lot of fill that needs to come in. Um, this would change the measurement so that it starts from propo proposed grade at the bottom and then goes up to the top of the building. Um, this would only apply within land use districts 31 and 43, which roughly um, parallel with uh, the McCain and Block 11 properties. Thank you, Mark. Any questions for Mark? So Mark, that proposed grade will be one foot above floodplain. Is that where the proposed grade would be? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it would have to be at, at, at that point. More than that. It would right. Be, in, that's a good point. measure from one foot above floodplain. That's a good point, Eric. Actually, the Planning Commission recommended that we add that at the meeting last week when we sent that by them. They said, provided the proposed grade is a minimum rising grade needed to raise a building one foot above flood elevation. Thank you. Any other questions? No, anyone in the audience wish to comment on this first reading tonight? None, the public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? On first reading, a movie pass. Council bill number 16, series 2021. The title of which has been read into the record. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion by council? <laughs> Roll call, please, Helen. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Mayor Manuela. Yes. Uh, we have Council Bill number, the second reading of Council Bill, no, or first reading of Council Bill number 17, Series 2021, an ordinance concerning a for rent workforce housing project in connection with authorizing the project, the leasing of certain town property, and the execution and delivery of a site lease, a lease purchase agreement, and other documents. This ordinance establishes the framework for the town to issue municipal debt pay for the construction of the new uh, for rent workforce housing project on block 11. Under the town's charter, uh, an action to issue municipal debt, which is what this will be in the form of a certificate of participation must be authorized by ordinance. And that's why this particular ordinance is in front of you. The ordinance, if adopted, would authorize the town to issue certificates of participation in the amount of $10 million at an interest rate not to exceed 3%. Uh, the ordinance makes reference to certain other ancillary documents that are directly related to the financing package, including a trust indenture, a, a site lease, a lease purchase agreement. All of those documents are available for your reading pleasure at the office of the town clerk. I'll tell you, they together exceed 100 pages. Um, they're just fascinating documents. <laughs> Um, the, the whole idea behind this particular form of financing certificates of participation um, is as briefly as follows. The town owns the land initially. The town um, leases the property to a trustee who immediately leases the property back to the town. And in connection with that, um, the town pays rent under the lease to the trustee in an amount sufficient to pay the certificates of purchase annually. The, and at the end of the, the payout period, the town will have repaid the $10,000 principal amount together with the 3% or whatever the interest rate is. And the town will then cancel the lease and everything will, will go on. Um, it is a very common uh, now a way of financing uh, construction projects by municipalities, partially because it does not require an election. That, that, that is well explained, Tim. Um, I guess I want to read the document now. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> uh, any questions for Tim? Anyone in the public wish to comment on this first reading? 
Is there a motion? On first reading, a move past Council Bill Number 17, Series 2021, the title of which has been read into the record. Second. There is a motion and a second. Any further discussion by Council? Roll call, please. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Owen. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Manuel. Yes. We have two resolutions tonight. The first is resolution number 14, series 2021. It's a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with Summit County government in the towns of Blue River, Dillon, Frisco, Montezuma, and Silverthorne regarding the implementation of fire restrictions in Summit County, Colorado. Chief. The town is a current participant with an IGA for that very uh, reason. There's a minor wording change this year. This resolution, if adopted, would just adopt, or excuse me, would accept the resolution, excuse me, would accept the IGA and authorize uh, Rick to sign it on behalf of the town. Chief, any questions? No, anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution? No, public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? I move we pass resolution number 14, series 2021, a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Summit County government in the towns of Blue River, Dillon, Frisco, Montezuma, and Silverthorne regarding the implementation of fire restrictions in Summit County, Colorado. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Mayor Manuel. Yes. Resolution number 15. A resolution establishing a local bid preference policy in connection with the award of town construction contracts. Tim. This resolution has been drafted um, at the direction of the council based on a discussion that we had with the council a couple of meetings ago, I guess. Uh, if adopted, the resolution will establish a procedure for local contractors as defined in the resolution. Uh, particularly disabled business enterprises to gain an advantage uh, in their bid for town construction projects. Shannon Smith's memo is in the is in the packet. I really can't add to that all, though I'll be able, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Um, I think that this is a really good start uh, for the for the town. Um, uh, staff understands that this will need to be re revisited next year. Uh, to see if it's actually uh, worked the way we hope it will. But I think Shannon and I both think this is a really good start. Thanks, Tim. Any questions for Tim? No, is there a motion, Jeffrey? I move we pass resolution number 15 as it was uh, series 2021, as was read into the record. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? No, roll call, please. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Manuela. Yes. Uh, planning Commission decisions. Are there any call ups this evening? Shouldn't be because there's nothing going on. <laughs> planning Commission decision stand is presented. And we do have uh, Planning Commission appointments. Um, Mark, do you want to say anything else or do you want me just to? Interviews were conducted with the following applicants Jim, Bradley, Jim Bradley. Frank Mason, Mark Leas, and Alan Fretcher. Interview uh, panel was impressed with the caliber of the applicants, recommends Mark Leas for appointment based on his hands-on historic preservation experience. Panel also re recommends Alan Fretcher, who has a degree in civil engineering and currently serves on Upper Blue Planning. Is there any questions for staff? Anybody in the comment on this one? Seeing none, is there a uh, motion to approve these two nominations? I move we approve. Mark, do these appointments fill vacancies or are they for full terms? Okay. Um, and do we know what, when the term will expire that they're being appointed to? Both of them? So the motion ought to be to appoint these two gentlemen to the planning commission um, until, to fill vacancies and to serve until October 2022. Got that? Yep. Okay. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. I move that we appoint Mark Leas uh, for appointment to uh, to the 
Planning Commission, as well as Alan Fretcher, and their term will run until October. This is a uh, fill-in uh, position. These are fill-in positions, and they will run till October 22, 2022. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mr. Carlson. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Mr. Uh, Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Jello. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mayor Manuel. Yes. Uh, we've already done report of town manager and staff and report of mayor and council. Are there any other matters this evening? I just have one. I want to uh, welcome the uh, the new kid, uh, Lindsay Toomer from Pittsburgh, uh, from, from Pennsylvania, the newest member of the Summer Daily News staff. She uh, went to Penn State. Oh, nice. Yeah. Welcome. Eric's from Pittsburgh. I'm, I'm from a uh, Pennsylvania guy, too. That's a good, <laughs> good, that's a good drive. The Nittany Lions. That's Nittany Nittany, yeah. Nittany Nittany Lions. I had a bunch of friends that went to Penn State. Oh, it's considerably Pittsburgh. older than you. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. And before we go, I want to thank Chief Baird. Uh, Mountain Dreamers had an informal dinner with the chief, all the chiefs in the county, and the sheriff with the immigrant community. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, Banff is this weekend for the BOEC, in case any of you don't know. I know it's it's come up quick, and it is um, drive-in style, uh, Friday and Saturday night. There are tickets still available, and I told Sonia I would mention that. So if any of you want to see some really cool movies, different movies both nights. Friday and Saturday. Banff and... Um, and Banff is Saturday also. And uh, Air Stage. Air Stage is Upper Blue. Oh, yeah. Air Stage is Friday. Both Friday. Both Friday. Friday, Friday, Friday and Saturday for uh, Banff. Yeah. So you could go Saturday then and yeah. support the BOEC. All right. Anything else this evening? Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned. But the guy here from Bobas, Bobas is like an